K Matt, we are live. What is up, guys? Welcome back to our Fish the Moment live stream. Today, we're talking about something that I never thought I would actually talk about. And it's something, Matt, that I've been very stubborn about for probably the past like three or four years. You and I have talked about it a lot off camera. And it's finally time. I think I need a little uh, taste of humble pie, maybe. I don't know if that's the way to say it, or I just need to embrace the changing times. I don't know what it is, but we're going to get into it because this is going to be maybe more of like a bass fishing therapy session for me, Matt. Uh, oh, and good. maybe it can help some of the viewers who are struggling with the same issue. Uh, but uh, I think either way, it's going to be a very interesting stream. I think a lot of people are going to have a lot of opinions, which always makes for a good live chat. So Yeah, let's do it. I, I don't, I mean, I kind of know what it's about now, but I, I didn't know what we were getting into. So uh, this could be, if it's where I think we're going with this, it could be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, before we get into all the uh, stuff, basically, I want to give a huge shout out to sponsor of the Fish the Moment live stream and all the long form content over at Fish the Moment, Bridgeford Foods. Bridgeford makes some of the best beef jerky that you can buy. You can find it at the checkout aisles of a lot of your local grocery stores, dollar stores, gas stations. My favorite is the sweet teriyaki. I always have a bag in the boat with me, and Matt's also a Bridgeford pro, has his boat wrapped with Bridgeford, so he can talk a little bit more even about Bridgeford as a company because they are great assets to the sport. Yeah, dude, they are a american-made family-owned business that specializes in a variety of meat products uh everything from perfect boat snacks like you've got there with a bag of jerky or some of the different uh meat sticks that they make or they've also got a bunch of different uh hard sausage like pepperoni and summer sausage uh, and the the cool thing is at this point you can find them like you said pretty much all over the country in a variety of different stores so if you want to support a company that su supports the fishing and outdoor industry, go buy a bag of Bridgeford products. Awesome. Good deal. Well, appreciate it. Shout out to Bridgeford. Definitely check out some Bridgeford beef jerky. Good stuff right there. Okay, Matt. So we're going to get into it. Don't share this with Randy, guys. If you're watching on the live stream, just just leave leave Randy out of this. He doesn't need. He needs to be able to sleep tonight. So we, we'll just leave Randy out of this one. So uh, let's, let's just roll with this, Matt, you and me. Okay, so... Okay watching a lot of tournaments lately right it's getting dominated by scopers that's what people call them but basically guys who are primarily focused on using live scope and that's their number one advantage in these tournaments is their ability to use live scope i think it's pretty evident now that it is the most dominant strategy in fishing i won't even say just like a technique but it's a strategy and i didn't for years think that live scope was going to become this year-round strategy something that works all the time in all situations and it was like going to play everywhere and that's what i've talked about for years i've always kind of held out on this idea that you just need to sell your soul to the live scope i thought there would be guys who could catch them up shallow like a greg hackney and still compete guys like myself who could graph schools of fish find some offshore fish with side imaging down imaging stuff like that and still compete but we're finding that that's not really the case anymore. We're finding that there are groups of, or really just isolated roaming fish that are only catchable with the live scope. And if you're not picking out those individual fish and targeting them with the live scope, you're not being as efficient as you can be, whether you're fishing deep or shallow, two foot of water to 80 or 90 feet of water. And guys who are using the traditional offshore fishing techniques or the traditional shallow water techniques can't keep up with the guys who are using live scope one second my dog is barking like crazy i'm in the middle of this rant let me check let me just give i can hear him in the background give me one second matt you respond to that for a second you vamp for me i don't know what's going on my dog's freaking the, fir the first thing i'm gonna say is johnny asked me to be on the live stream and he would not tell me what the topic was going to be so i didn't know that we were even going to be talking forward facing sonar tonight the other thing i'm going to say is i actually thought we were <laughs> After his intro, I thought we were going to talk about how he is zeroed the last two times he's been out on Grand Lake. Like, I thought that's what we were going to talk about. But apparently we're taking this the forward-facing sonar way. I was Johnny, I was just telling him, I thought we were going to talk about how you zeroed the last two times on Grand Lake. Like, I thought that's where you were going with this. And in, in fact, it's forward-facing sonar. So, uh, 
what I will say in response to what you just said is that it it one hundred percent does appear to be a forward facing sonar dominated tournament world. Now I'm not I'm like I'm I feel like I'm Switzerland in this. I'm not necessarily one one way or the other. I use it when I need to, and I put it away when I think it's hurting me. And you know I I will continue to you know I I could have won Angler of the Year last year. And I did not really weigh in many fish at all using it. I think I weighed three or four fish all year long. So I'm not going to sit here and say you can't compete with it. What I will say is you can't compete with it in certain situations and on certain bodies of water. Like, you know, my first event for the Bass Pro Tour on Toledo Bend. I mean, the fish were not on the bank yet. They were out in the flooded timber around bait. And, you know, suspended, the ones I was catching were suspended over 40 to 50 feet of water. And the reality is there, there's no good way to target those fish without forward facing sonar. You could go out and, and you could graph and you could potentially, you know, find some bait, maybe see some, some fish, whether you're using side imaging or 2d, but once you've identified that area, you're just fan casting. You're random casting, hoping to potentially come in contact with a fish. And I will tell you, like in that Toledo Bend case, the fish really were, you know, very specific. So you had to make the right cast. You had to present it in front of them. It was not simply like you come within 20 feet of them, they swim over and eat it. So, you, you know, from a random casting standpoint, you're just not going to be efficient doing that. So in a situation like that 100 percent forward facing sonar is the way to go we saw it at the bassmaster lake fork event where there was a decent shallow bite going now i would have loved to have seen the weather be stable in that event because it does sound like the shallow water guys were holding their own but with the condition changed the fish pulled back out and therefore it almost made the the offshore game and when i say offshore a lot of those fish were still caught in relatively shallow water that four to ten foot range but it was uh, fish that were spawning or moved up to spawn and the shallow water guys were catching with a cold front they actually moved back out and it almost helped the guys who were forward facing sonar that's a, that's how i interpret it but in that situation the guys who were fishing the bank were were dead i mean at that point you can't compete for sure Sorry, Matt. My dog is literally freaking out. Give me one second. I, th this is not a good way to what's start. What's going on? I have no idea. My with. dog never barks. I don't know what's happening. Give me I didn't even know you had a dog. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, guys, I mean, I, I, I will tell you this. Uh, Wisconsin yesterday is putting out their potential votes to ban forward-facing sonar and 360 imaging, and that's something that is going to open up a whole new can of worms. And I don't know, I have no idea what direction that's going to go. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that unrolls over the next couple of years. Cause it's not a, it'll take a while, but uh, yeah, dude. So, I mean, do I think forward facing sonar is a heck of a tool and will continue to be a dominant force? Absolutely. Like it's only going to continue to get better. That's the scary part about it. For sure. Uh, I, I think Randy was out there trying to take my live scope. So at least my dog is saving me from, uh, anyways, we're all good. So, um, Randy, did you see Randy caught him good today? I know that's good. He good is deal. like 16 something. I, awesome. I want to know I, what do you think he was doing? Mag draft. Maybe it's Kentucky Lake. Uh, I would have said, I think he was cranking rock transitions. That's pretty. Yeah. Oh, he could be doing, both, know. you know, mag draft in the rock. Uh, so, what I was trying to get at here with this, Matt, is kind of like, so this is what I was trying to get at with my selling out to the live scope. So you mentioned, thank you, by the way, that I zeroed twice on Grand Lake. So I thought that's when you said you wanted to have a therapy session. Well, I thought that's we're what getting you there. meant by that. We're getting there. Okay. That was part, that's okay. part of it. I was trying to ease myself in, but you just went straight for the you know dagger to the heart. Appreciate that. Hey, so you've you've beat me so many times in the boat that if I can if I can brag a little bit I'm just fine about that. So here's basically what's been happening. Let me hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> let me just let me just say I also zeroed the first day of my last tournament, so I understand how it is. Like I I get it. Yeah, doesn't happen often, ever. Yeah, 
Yeah, so this is what's been going on with me. So I am in this conflict of my fishing styles, and I think that that's what's causing me to have... I'm having this, like, indecision. And this happened to me when I was younger, when I was, like, in between fishing offshore and fishing shallow in tournaments. And I figured out that I needed to just commit 100% to fishing offshore in my practice and my fishing days because it was so hard for me to separate the two. And I found that I could be effective at catching fish offshore off, uh, in all tournaments year round if I just focused and, and went to that strategy, especially because it was back then no one was doing it. So I had the run of all the good stuff. So now I'm trying to again, play the middle where I'm trying to use the live scope to chase isolated individual fish, but I'm also trying to use my old school methods of graphing, side imaging, down imaging, all these things. And what I'm finding is that I am less effective when I am, the more I'm using live scope, the less effective I'm becoming and the fewer fish I'm catching when I try to target those isolated individual fish. And I think I've got to the root cause of it, but I think that what's kind of happening is that when I would graph before with my electronics, I would graph areas, I would find schools of fish that had 5 to 30 fish in them. I would pull up, I would make 5 casts on that spot, 10 casts on that spot. If I got bit, awesome, I would move on. Or if I didn't get bit, or if I did get bit, obviously I'd sit there and catch them. But if I didn't get bit, I'd make 5 casts, 10 casts, move on, maybe hit that school 2, 3 more times throughout the day. I couldn't see what the fish were doing. I couldn't tell they were reacting to my bait. I couldn't do all that stuff. So I just had to basically pull up blind casts at them a few times and move. And that technique worked extremely well. I've documented my offshore fishing playbook. It's all over my YouTube channel. That's how I fished for years. Well, now what's happening is I do the same method. I graph these schools of fish and I find myself sitting on the spot for 30 minutes trying to rotate through 10 baits with the forward facing sonar, get, try to make those fish bite, try to make it happen. Or I get into an area where I'm like, hey, I see six to eight scattered fish around an area. I think I can go pick those off with the live scope versus finding a group. And it's way less effective overall because I'm wasting a lot of time fishing spots that maybe the fish aren't active. But I'm also wasting a lot of time graphing when I could just be dropping the scope on random spots. So all this comes to a trip I took yesterday with one of my friends out on Beaver Lake. And I needed like some, I needed a boost to my morale. And we literally just were going out there and he's like, man, I'm gonna show you how I'm catching some fish out here on Beaver. And we would just roll up to spots that I'd fished all these spots before. I have every single, graphed all these spots dozens of times. And we would just roll up, he would drop the scope down, look at the spot, see if there were fish up there. He would throw a few casts. If the fish reacted well or, or not or whatever, he would pick up the troll motor or we would keep fishing and we'd move on. And we never graphed a single spot, but we would drop the scope, live scope the good spots or around the good spots, pick the live scope up and keep rolling. And we crushed them. We caught a ton of fish, had a great day, and we never graphed a spot once with side imaging, down imaging, 2D sonar. But we also only got bid on a handful of spots. We didn't get bid on that many. But we were making probably three to four times as many casts as I would normally do in a fishing day. And we were still graphing the areas with live scope. And it made me feel like, okay, do I even need to be graphing as much as I'm graphing? Is is it even worth it? Or should I just be pulling up on spots that look decent with the wind blowing on them or the contours or the water clarity is right or whatever? Just drop the scope and go. And I've talked to a lot of pros who've said, yeah, I'm that's what I'm doing nowadays. I just drop the scope and go. And I was so against that for a long time. But it feels like that is now what you need to be doing if you want to be efficient and effective, especially with the scope. I don't know if that's a fully true, but that's what I'm finding in my fishing at least. I mean, I think a lot of what you said is true. I So let me ask you a question. Had you not been on, what were you, were you on Beaver? Beaver. What lake were you on? Beaver. So that's a lake that you, I, you're familiar with. I assume the other guy was familiar with it as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Had you been on a lake you've never been on, would you have graphed the spots before making that cast? Cause there's a difference between knowing the spot already. Like, cause at that point there is no reason to graph it. You can pull up and you can, you know, most people are using their forward facing sonar as like a side imaging at the same time. Right. You know, you're, you're looking for the cover, you're looking for the structure. A lot of times if you're talking bottom related fish, you're not actually seeing the fish until you pull them up and they, they come after your bait. So from that standpoint, you know, I, I think if you're on a lake you're familiar with, there's not much reason to be graphing. I think if you're still on a new lake and you're trying to find some of those sweet spots and where to put your, 
your forward facing sonar down and take a peek, you know, I think at that point there's still some value in doing it, but there's definitely a movement towards, towards, uh, mo there's a movement moving away from other electronics to just the forward facing sonar. You know, a lot of the guys, the best guys out there that I've talked to are that same way, you know, they might run through an area and, you know, if they see bait as they're moving through it, they'll put it down and they scan for five, 10 minutes. And if there's fish on that bait, they'll know real fast. And if there isn't, they pick up and they keep moving. And the, the, int the interesting part to me though, is like what you said about chasing some of those more rogue individual fish. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is do you think that those people are targeting those fish more because they're they're actually easier to catch because they're less pressured? Because I, I think there's I think the offshore game has become much more difficult. It was getting much more difficult even before uh forward facing sonar. Like everyone, you know, you go to like a, a TVA ledge lake 10 years ago, you'd find schools and there'd be hundred. And now you go, you go and it's hard to even find a school of fish. And I personally i feel like what's happened is there's so much pressure on the offshore fish and shallow water fish that you have a lot more fish that are just roamers now 100%. and the thing is an individual roamer gets a lot less pressure so in my opinion those fish are actually easier to catch a lot of the times well and here's like a which makes them more targeting yeah and that's i think that's part of the issue like when i went to grand the other day i was telling you on the phone I graphed for five hours and never found a school of fish in a brush pile on a rocky yeah. spot. That's like never happened. I've never go five hours of graphing and don't find crap. The one thing I found though was I dropped the scope just randomly on a few spots. Just and I and I wouldn't have zeroed if I would had run this. And I'll show you what I was talking about. I'm gonna share my my Navionics here real quick with you guys. And I'm gonna share it with Matt too. Give, give a second. It'll it'll kick back here. Um, Okay, so you guys can see this now. This is Navionics. So I'm going to go to Grand. This is what I was doing, Matt. And this is the part that was crazy. Um, oh, I need to move this over here. One second, guys. Okay. Uh, okay. Now you can see it. Okay. What in the world? Gotta love live streams, guys. Everything is disappearing and reappearing. Okay, we're good. Okay. So basically what was happening is I was here on Grand. And I was running some random creeks, right? And I was just running through here. And what I found, I wanted to graph the, this creek here. And I wanted to see if I could find some fish suspended on bait or whatever. And so I graphed this entire creek, went all the way through here. Never saw any bait, never saw anything. But I saw one random fish suspended on my down imaging. So I'm like, I'm going to stop and try to cast at it. I don't know. I, just, I didn't see anything else in this whole creek. I get in front of this boat dock. It's right on it. You can't really tell from Navionics, but it is a perfect rock transition point steep the rocks transition perfectly it's like ideal pre-spawn spot juice area and i'm like okay i'm just gonna drop the scope and go around this juice area go around it i see a fish on the dock one fish cast over a, a hovering at it work it work it work it it falls it for a long time and i let it fall away to the bottom he doesn't eat it and that's it just happens you get two out of every 10 fish to bite on this situation I went through a few of these other docks, didn't see any other fish on these docks, just real quick. And then I ran to this creek, and I graphed the entirety of this creek from here all the way to the back of it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to stop on a few docks. And I stopped on this random dock right here and this random dock right here. And I checked these other ones, and there were more isolated individual fish, just one fish on each of these docks. And these are just juicy-looking docks that you would just see, and you're like, those look good. And I rolled up, and there's a fish in front of them. And I'm like, there it is. And I throw at him and I threw a jerk bait on one of them. It actually bit it and came off. I lost it. And then another one chased the jerk bait all the way back. And I was like, crap. So I graphed for 45 minutes maybe to cover this creek and this creek. But it took me eight minutes to fish around this point, maybe six minutes to fish around this point and a few of these docks. And it took me um, three minutes to fish this and seven minutes to fish this so and i was able to put my bait in front of three fish and it was just randomly pulling up and i'm like okay well i know on grand even in the summer like this area is going to be good right in here there's some brush and stuff out here 
why would I graph this first when I could just drop the scope and go run at it? Or go on a ledge like this that maybe I don't need to know where all the brush piles are, but I can just get on this ledge, roll down it, and if I see something, I just fire at everything. What's the point of side imaging at first if I know that it looks like a really juicy spot? Now there's the argument like you're saying where if you don't know the lake all that well, maybe graphing it could help you to find some brush and things like that. But overall, like as long as you know how to read a contour map, you can pretty well tell where decent looking areas are. And it's way more efficient at times to drop it, go through this little drain and check these points. Because even if there's only four fish there that are decent, you might be able to pick off those four fish that are randomly through here instead of wasting your time graphing it. And you're only saving yourself maybe, what, three to five minutes of your day by graphing it rather than putting your trolling motor on 10 and live scoping it and you have a chance to throw it three or four isolated fish. So now it's like, why am I even bothering graphing stuff when I know what structure looks good? I know where the key little sweet little zones are just based on historical things, and I can target the individual fish. Pair that now with these guys in the Elite Series who have days of practice. Maybe they get a couple spots, you know, never know what happens there. Maybe they get a couple juice holes. And now they know exactly where to go. What's the point of ever graphing anymore? Why not just drop the scope and just fish everything? That's yeah, a long dude, rant. I, I'm sorry, I, Matt. I was just, I'm, I'm like, I don't no, know. I, 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 I put food on my table this way, right? So like, I'm, I'm having the same conundrum. Like it's, it's changed the way I practice. It's changed the way I approach these lakes. And, you know, part of me says it is the better way to go about when you, you know, if you're even on a new lake, if, if with our mapping that we have now being so good that if it is a key juicy looking spot, you're probably better just to throw the trolling motor down, scan around real quick and see what's there. Because, you know, at that point you're going to see the fish and you haven't drove over them. I feel like a lot of these fish do scatter when they, you know, have a motor go over the top of them. So from that standpoint, it is a better way to go about it. And, you know, I would actually, I would actually say that, you know, people are top level anglers now, and I didn't have this and I didn't think it would necessarily be as good as it has, but I've watched several YouTube videos now showing guys running forward facing sonar in both directions off their jack plate. And they're idling with that instead of really using their side imaging and I've been blown away at how efficient that is. And, you know, I originally thought you'd be, you know, it would be such quick blips. You'd never be able to really figure out what's going on. But, you know, based on the cone being spread, there's actually, you know, if you're idling at a very slow pace, a fish is on there longer than you think. A ball of shad is longer and you can really break it down. And you can see, you know, for me, forward facing sonar, I... Being that I run Lowrance Electronics, I don't have a 360, but mm -hmm. my forward-facing sonar really functions for me very similar to a 360 where I'm scanning, looking for uh, bottom contour, I'm looking for a stump, I'm looking for brush piles, and I'm not necessarily looking for fish. But you, you know, as you're idling around with forward-facing sonar off the jack plate, you can basically still see the brush pile, the contour line. So it really has gotten to the point where in my opinion, it's going to replace quite a bit of your side imaging as well. I have a confession to make too, Matt. <laughs> yeah, you're doing that? Are you doing that? I have a live scope mounted where one of my old trains, cause I, have a, I had an extra live scope transducer cause I went from LVS 32 to 34, mounted on the back of my boat where I can basically, it's shooting underneath the hull of my boat from like the motor out in front of me so when i'm driving the boat it's basically just pointing straight down and out and i can idle around and i can find bait balls like so fast it's the easiest thing in the world to find bait yeah. balls with that and i just was just messing around with it and i didn't know if it was gonna be good or not so i haven't talked about it in videos but it's like it's insane like if the fish are in these like drains or whatever it's so fast to find these bait fish way faster than using down imaging side imaging like it, it, it's way way yeah. better and i can just kind of turn the boat and move but also there's a comment well, about that, like that's... go ahead matt no i was just gonna say that's the thing that amazed me in watching these videos of how clear it was like how 
a bait ball stands out 10 times better than you'd see that bait ball shadow really on your side imaging. So, I mean, it, it, it forward facing sonar, not only does it basically give you everything that 2d 360 side imaging, it's all in one and it's live. Yeah. So it's like, it's everything you need in one. And I really believe that as the technology advances, you're going to see it become more of all of that in one meaning like, if you use it like your side imaging, you will get much better detail of the bottom. Like at some point on your forward facing sonar, you probably will be able to see the actual roots on a stump, right? Like oh, it'll 100%. be that clear. Well, and there was someone who said that, you know, the there was a comment earlier that said something about now that everyone's live scoping, the shallow are flipping bites going to get better. And uh, I hate to break it to you. I was on Beaver the other day, and I caught a fish in three foot of water, Matt. This is yesterday. I say other day. It was yesterday. I caught a fish flipping a jig into a shallow laydown in three feet of water on a flat gravel bank and watched the fish, watch my jig fall, watch the fish swim down to it, eat my jig, set the hook, and catch like a two and three quarter pounder. And this is mm-hmm. a shallow, you know, boat was in eight foot laydowns in three feet and live scoping these fish in these shallow laydowns and you can just roll through these laydowns and just see if, is there a fish is there not and you can just go down these banks way faster you can see them on flat gravel banks you can see them on chunk rock banks you can just see the fish there's there's no reason that, that to, is, yeah yeah that that is that is a major misconception uh that honestly i feel like a lot of the professional anglers have created that perception that it can't be used in shallow water it is 100 percent being it is dominating a lot of shallow water the same way it is deep water i mean there i i'm i'm guilty of this like from a practice standpoint i pull up to a lay down why make a cast in there and potentially get that fish to respond to my bait if i can scan it first and see a fish in there if i see a dot that's all i need to know that's all i mean i don't want it i don't want that fish to come in contact with my bait. I would rather have him be there and not be familiar with my bait come tournament time. And, you know, we were just at uh, Sandy Cooper. I mean, that's Cypress Tree Galore, and we were fishing a foot and a half. To, most of those are a foot and a half, three foot of water. They were, I, I I didn't get that going. I mean, I saw some fish, but I actually found that it was a hindrance to me where I'd, I'd sit on a tree for way too long trying to get that fish to respond. But there was lots of guys that were just scoping trees. There were guys in practice that were just scoping trees and not didn't even have a rod in their hand. Like, and Wheeler's catching him in I mean, six inches of full of water visibility on a freaking Demiki rig in brush piles and six to eight foot of water. Yeah. Chocolate milk visibility catching him. So, no, like it's and the thing is, man, is like on a big lake like Grand Lake, for example. My the reason I felt like I was so effective back in the day, and this is why I'm having this crisis of like identity crisis of this is, I think I'm an offshore electronics guy. I've always been the electronics guy, but my electronics techniques are just strictly less efficient. I think actually, if I take the live scope and only use it for target identification, so let's say I go through and I like graph a spot like. A little point like this or something and all i'm doing is i'm graphing through this area identifying where the object is and firing on it good to go i can catch i could catch those fish and that's the same thing like a 360 imaging did but if you look at some of the guys like brian thrift 360 was his bread and butter he's dominated the tours with 360 and to your point there were a lot more groups of fish fish on these isolated targets but Brian Thurst's not dominating anymore. It's the live scope guys. So obviously there's been a change, I feel like, in these behavior too, where my style of fishing that was very effective from 2008 to 2020 ish, 2021, it's becoming way, way less efficient and effective. And I think it's just a matter of like these, there is a new approach that is just the better way of doing it. Now, I will caveat all of this. You need to know where the fish are on the lake still. You need to know which creeks have the bait fish in it. You know which creeks have the dirty water, stained water. They're getting the wind blowing on them. That have a higher population of fish. There's these macro elements that are still really important to bass fishing. So it's not just like drop the scope in the mouth of this pocket and roll to the very back. You're not going to go do well doing that. But the guys that are doing it are not doing that. They're not just dropping the scope randomly and going. 
they know where the key little stretches are from practice or the key little like maybe 30 40 yard stretches are and some of that's they get three four days of practice some of this they get information ahead of time that they know where the key areas are whatever it is or it's guys they're locals that have fished the lake for years and know where those key sweet spots are and now they're using live scope in those areas but it's one of those deals that i think that there's like this misconception i feel like at least that live scope is being used like just for Demiki rig fishing down here like in the pockets and the coves and stuff like that no it's being used for everything it's any any style of fishing you've ever used ever tried you can catch them with it lily pad stems and two foot of water throwing a spinner bait you can use live scope to your advantage in those situations and it's just a tool to say this is where the fish are and it's good enough technology now people don't understand it enough that you can basically just tell are there fish in this area or they're not and it's it's I know it seems silly because I know that seems like ah oh, duh that's obvious Johnny but like the guys weren't doing that I feel like even up until this last year or two or at least making it mainstream I know I haven't been so that's where my big dilemma's been oh you're muted Matt I don't know how you got muted but you're muted um yeah, so I think there's a, a couple of things with that. You know, I, there's there's definitely been arguments that, well, live, live scope specifically has been around for like, I don't know, five, six, seven years or something, like 2018 maybe. And, you know, we haven't seen like, you know, why is it all of a sudden just dominating or, you know, why didn't it dominate back then? And the reality is the the technology has gotten significantly better the last couple of years. Uh, but a big part of it was there were only a handful of guys really using it, right? Like, yeah. you know, if you're looking at the professional level, Garmin was a relatively new company. Most guys were sponsored by Hummingbird or Lawrence and they weren't able to use it. Lawrence, you know, really didn't come out with anything until I'm going to say like two years ago, like active target came out and the, you know, it took a couple of years. I think they've been around maybe three years is what it's been now. But, you know, so it, we're at a point now, the last two years, really, where everybody has has got them. Like, I think Hummingbird, I think, is a, allowing their sponsored guys to run uh, forward facing sonar. That's not a Hummingbird product now. So, like, everyone has it. There was a several years there where there were a handful of guys that were running it and nobody else was really doing it. So you really can't look at the power of it until the last couple of years. But having said that, it it took some time for people to figure out how to use it best. And that's the thing, like now you're seeing the power of it. You're seeing guys figure out how to put it to work. You know, for me, when I first had it, it was like, okay, well, I'm gonna go scan this dock before I fish the dock. And it made me, really inefficient is what happened yep. uh and you know it took me a little while to kind of figure out this is these are the types of areas where i really need it these are the types of areas where i'm going to have it on and i might scan something but i'm not really it's not dictating how i'm fishing it's really i'm using it maybe i'll find a stump behind the boat to cast that or something along those lines but it's it's taken some years but now we're seeing so much geared specifically to it we're seeing a lot of other products come out that are uh, enhancing the the efficiency and the abilities of your forward facing sonar, and I don't see any of that really stopping. So I think it'll continue to get more more powerful. But I I really do think one of the biggest strengths of forward facing sonar is the ability to target individual fish that were almost not targetable before, and and I think you know. For ever since the COVID years, everyone's like, my lakes are so pressured, so pressured. I'm not catching anything and blah, you know, it's just the fish got that much more pressured. They really did, whether shallow or deep. And it just makes those isolated individual random fish that much more crucial to a successful day on the water. 100%. Well, and a couple of comments too. One, uh, someone was saying, how dare you talk bad about thrifty? I, I, I'm a big fan of Brian Thrift. I've talked about this many times. He's like my favorite angler. I modeled a lot of my fishing around his fishing. Really big fan of what he does. So like, I'm not bashing Brian Thrift. Like, I see myself as like a student of like what Brian Thrift does because he was like 
dominating fishing, and it was very similar to my strategy and my style. I'm just I he dom he had a limit like every single tournament for like 75 tournaments in a row, guys. And he's now in five fish or in the every fish counts everything. He won red Christ. He's really good, but he's not like doing. He was like what Wheeler was doing, what Wheeler's doing now. Thrift was doing that in what like 16, 17. Would you agree with that, Matt? Like that was kind of. I mean, there was, there was, uh, I mean, it, I've basically fished against him my entire career. So, I mean, I feel like he's always kicked my behind. Uh, but there, I mean, there was a period where he was, yeah, he was the Kevin Van Dam, the Jacob Wheeler. I still feel like he's every bit, you know, is good. Oh, but yeah, I mean, I course. guess from a, if you were, to, if you were to compare results, yes, he probably, he's in a slump for brian thrift but, but i think I mean, yeah he's, he's still amazing he's, he's reigning red crest champion so i can tell you it's not like he still doesn't win i mean i i i consider him still very much one of the best in the game let's yeah. put it that way he's just he did i know he was a late adopter and he's talked about this i've listened to a lot of his stuff he's a late he was a late adopter to the forward facing stuff and so yep. that has not helped him in his it is what he's been doing so not to get off on that big tangent but the other question was like, why would I put a live scope on my transom by my side imaging, down imaging, like by the back engine when I already have side imaging and down imaging? Well, the thing about it is it's so much easier if I graph this creek. I can put my forward range on the live scope I have on my, tr my transom out 100 feet, and I can turn my boat this way and that way, and I'm scanning 100 feet in front of me. I can then pick up, run 200, 300 feet in front of me, and then do the same thing real fast, pick up, run, and I can get a good sense where the bait fish are in general in a creek. To do that with side imaging, down imaging, you kind of have to zigzag for a lot longer. So I can graph a creek through the center of this thing if I'm just looking for bait specifically, only bait. I can do it in a fifth of the time, a tenth of the time potentially, and graph if I'm just graphing for bait. And that's a very specific scenario, but it is something that plays a lot in the wintertime. So that's just kind of the idea and in the fall too. But kind of getting back on the, the topic it's like the reason i'm frustrated a little bit by it matt is because i don't like the idea of just selling out to the live scope like just targeting isolated individual fish because i don't really enjoy like i don't know it doesn't feel good to me and i know that that's like i'm a pro i'm not a fishing from a living putting food on my table so like uh with like pro fishing so i don't necessarily have to use the live scope i could make content without the live scope and do that but I also want to be teaching the most cutting edge in fishing, the, the, the best of the best. And I realize now that it, by holding on to my old methods, the things I've done for years, I am not actually doing the best of the best techniques. I am actually doing things that are technically worse than what is optimal. Like I'm doing suboptimal things, which is not what I want to be teaching on YouTube or what I want to be doing. And if you look at the top of the opens or, or the top of the elite series, all the guys that did well in the Opens last year are doing really well in the Elite Series this year. And they're all young guns who are great at scoping. And that's just how it goes. There's a lot of guys who are really good at scoping who are doing well in the Elite Series. And they have that skill set. They've mastered it. They honed it in the Bassmaster Opens with all this fishing pressure and all this stuff. Now they're unleashed on the Elite Series and they're kicking butt. And, I mean, it just goes to show that that skill set is extremely valuable and is the future at least for right now it could change fish could get you know cooked by the transducer and maybe they get you know uh, scared of it but at least for right this exact minute it is the best way to catch him for sure yeah I, I mean i think i think what you're going through is probably similar to probably you know what brian thrift feels and i you know i haven't discussed with him any of this so i i really don't know that but you know, when you're a master of all of your other electronics, there's a lot more into understanding all of the different features of all those different types of electronics. Whereas like we were just talking about before this, you kind of have all of that mixed into your life. So if you're a master of the forward facing, you you kind of skipped all that other stuff because now you get all that built in. So it, it yeah it devalues a lot of what you had already accomplished and mastered. And, you know, really like if I were to say anything with respect to Brian Thrift's fishing, I don't personally think he's probably lost a step at all. I think more than anything, the competition has 
gotten better to the point where he was a master of all these different things. And now the fact that people are mastering just the forward facing is like equaling what he was doing beforehand, just using the one item. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's the discussion that everyone's having right now, you know, from the standpoint of like somebody like myself, I've always kind of been a jack of all trades. You know, I, I definitely prefer shallow water power fishing. I do a little bit of everything I feel like. And, you know, when electronics come out, I, I probably don't spend the, the time I should spend on it all, but I feel very comfortable with them all as well so it's not like i can't do it i i do do it i've always felt like i need to learn everything that comes out but you know with the current power of forward facing sonar it is something where it's like man you do you know you do feel like a lot of your previous experience and knowledge and expertise has been kind of thrown out the window because now this new tool is so powerful you need to adjust to it and not saying you got to only use it, but if you can figure out how to use it in every scenario, you're going to be a much better angler. Yeah, there's a great comment here by Mr. Larson. He says, Hackney said before forward-facing sonar, uh, or before, before forward-facing sonar, it was a game of who was the best guesser. Now you see it live, so it's not. And I would say it wasn't maybe guesser, but like I would say forecasters. They're forecasting where the fish should be. You're taking all the elements into account, and you're trying to make an educated guess, I guess is guessing, of where the fish are going to be. Now you can just pull up and be like, there are fish there, there are not fish there. And so as long as you have enough time to practice or you get info ahead of time or whatever it is that's happening, it's there's a lot of ways that people find spots. As long as you're in an area with fish, now it's a game of which micro adjustment to my bait or my color or my retrieve or all these things are going to get more of the fish I cast at to bite. So if I can get five of the 10 fish I cast at to bite versus three, I'm going to win this tournament probably over the guy who's getting three bites doing the same thing. The other thing is there's still people saying in the comments that the live scope techniques are going to get less effective. The thing is though, is that what if live scope itself gets better to the point where the technology gives becomes clearer. It's easier to see the fish. You could even differentiate a crappie from a bass maybe because the technology gets so clear and good. Now you just know that you're seeing a bass and you figure out how to get those fish to bite. It's again, it's you can do the shallow, deep in dirty water, clear water, live scoping techniques. It's not a live scoping technique anymore. It's almost like Matt, if I was going to explain it, it's like you're going to play i'm trying to think of a good analogy of this off the top of my head but it's like um golf and it's like you have a golf golf clubs and before you could try different brands of golf clubs you could try like a little bit of different like length of the shaft you could adjust a few things but then they introduced a super driver and the super driver lets you hit the ball perfectly straight and you can hit it you know right at the hole every single time and then it just becomes a matter of who's the best putter. All the other clubs in the bag disappear, and it's just the super driver and then the putting. And you take a lot of the elements out of the game, and it kind of feels like that with the forward-facing sonar slightly, is that it's not something where it's like forward-facing sonar is part of the game. It's like you almost feel like you need to use the live scope or the forward-facing sonar. Like It's not a tool anymore. It's like that is what the game is. It's forward-facing sonar than fish it's like a prerequisite to anything is kind of what it feels like almost in my fishing and that's how if i'm going to adapt to this to this deal that's almost how i want to make it because it does make you more efficient and it's like it's like i'm going to go forward facing sonar that's a prerequisite everything else is like it's not like i'm in the forward facing sonar or not today it's just i'm going to go do it no matter what does that make sense i don't know if i'm explaining yeah. it well yeah well it yeah it definitely makes sense i, I you know the with respect to the comment of forward facing sonar becoming uh, l like less, what was the, what was the exact comment? It was uh, forward facing sonar would become less powerful or impactful yeah. or lose its value or, yeah. you know, the, the, my counter to that, I mean, obviously we're going to continue to get much better technology, which is going to offset potentially the fish. I mean, we can say the fish, you know, are already getting turned off by the sonar. I mean, I'll tell you this. I mean, the fish continue to come up. I mean, they'll swim right up and look at your trolling motor under the boat. Like, 
while you're looking at them coming up and doing it. Like I don't, I don't personally think the fish feel anything. Uh, I, we had a, I had a big Berkeley function I was at and they had a, uh, a Garmin engineer that was there talking about it. And he's like, there's nothing being emitted that the fish can even pick up. There's no vibrations being given off. So they were kind of like, that doesn't make sense to us. And, but the, the, the reality of it is I don't think you're going to have forward facing sonar become less impactful because you're not catching them with forward facing sonar you're catching them with the bait. So if you're going to make that argument, it's okay. The Demiki rig might become less, you know, might become not as good as it was. But the thing with that is there's always another bait then to rotate through, right? There's always, whether it's a new bait or a bait that those fish haven't seen, that's, that's what the fish will actually get accustomed to is the bait choice. And, and the forward facing sonar is not actually presenting a bait. It's, giving you the ability to make 25 casts with 25 different baits to figure out what those fish want that given day. And that's, that's really where the power is. So I don't, I don't with tech technological advances that will be coming, I don't see any way that it's not going to be more impactful versus, you know, becoming less of a valuable tool. Yeah. And I think, I mean, there's a lot of things about four facing sonar that people are still like, the fish don't jump in the boat. I'm not trying to say that. I'm not trying to make these arguments there. Like, it's the easiest thing in the world because it's not. I mean, I go to, I have lots of my boat and I zero on grand. So, like, obviously, it's not the easiest thing in the world. But, like, the thing about it is that timing becomes then really important. Those fish, like, early morning, later in the day, they bite better. When the wind front and fronts change, if you can find an area with a little bit clearer water or this much bait or less bait or more bait, there's all these other little micro factors that you still have to take into account. But it feels like with the game, all those factors are still extremely important and make separate one angler from another. But those are factors that people can also kind of control. Like, and you can kind of get that figured out, especially at the top level. And it does feel like it's becoming that game of, okay, once I kind of get a zone where I know they're at or I know what they're doing and I know there's good fish here, just like there's good fish everywhere, what's the best presentations, the baits, the retrieves, all those things? And it's a new game, Matt, because like, I I personally will admit, like, I wasn't a big fan of ever, like, trying to, like, color my swim baits a special color or, like, change my retrieve perfectly or, like, I, I never really enjoyed all that, like, micromanagement of the baits and the retrieve and the gear. Like, I hated that crap. I still hate that crap. I liked <laughs> being able to graph a spot. When I pull up there, I can throw a jig or a crankbait. Depending if it's windy, I throw a crankbait. If it's not, I throw a jig. And if they're going to bite, they're going to eat the thing and swallow it, and I'm going to set the hook and catch the fish. And you just can't really do that super well with the forward facing sonar. It doesn't really play like that. And I haven't found a situation where I can just pick up a jig, just run everything on the lake with forward facing sonar also and beat the guys or do better than the guys who are micromanaging all those little bait, tiny things and have 12 different rods with six different weight jig heads. Like that stresses me the heck out, Matt. Like when I have more than like, I've been stressed out too. This is another like therapy thing. Uh, not to say like, that's not weird, but like, it's like me, like working through this, like, trauma I have is I have like 12 rods in deck in my boat all the time because I know that that's what I need to be doing but part of me is like I just want to put a three quarter ounce football jig in the deck of my boat and like a swim bait and just go and throw those two things all day and can you do that on days and catch them yeah but like the other half of the days I'm not going to catch crap because they want a Demiki rig or they want a Nico rig that's dropped down or they want an eighth ounce Nico rig versus a one sixteenth ounce Nico rig and it matters it makes a difference and I've seen it make a difference I just don't it's just annoying <laughs> I know that that's like so, so you know we we I mean we talk a lot right yeah and I I've never I've never asked you this but I mean we both have this same kind of dilemma I'm curious and I don't know that there's an answer for this I'm curious from your standpoint, are you struggling with it because of a more like a moral issue where you have issue from the standpoint of it's like you feel like it's almost cheating on like from a fish standpoint? Are you struggling with it because it devalues you feel like it devalues you because you've worked so hard to be a master of all the electronics and now you feel like a lot of that's not as valuable, you know, or is it just because you really don't enjoy using it? 
and you would rather do it the way you were doing it like I'm, I'm curious to know like where like where are the i mean there's definitely like a sense of hesitancy on your part 100 percent. which is kind of odd considering you're the tech guy you're the guy the electronics guru like i think most people would assume that johnny schultz is like i want to be all in on forward facing sonar but there's there's a lot of hesitancy on your part so this is what I've kind of narrowed it down to in my head is I have always been the most excited about finding bass. That's what makes me the most excited. And I love the concept of going out into a lake, contour map or not, going out in the middle of the lake where you don't know what's out here. Maybe you have this like, you know, fictional contour map in your head and maybe you can get like a side imaging image to kind of give you an idea of what's going on. But it's like still a little bit like vague and you put all these puzzle pieces together and you pull up on a point out here and you bomb a cast out there and boom, and you set the hook and you catch a fish and you're like, I did all this work. I studied these maps. Yeah. I use this graph. I found all the pieces and I got that fish to bite. And I threw my bait out there. And that's exciting. And I would sometimes, Matt, I'd pull up, I'd catch three fish out of the school, and I'd be like, okay, I'm done. And I would just leave, and I would go try to find another school. Because I wasn't there to go catch the fish. I was there to find the yeah. fish. That's what got me excited about fishing. And now... Dude, that's that's the straight... <laughs> that's, that's the crossword dilemma I have when I do crosswords. It's like, you want to do the whole puzzle yourself, and then there's always like, you can't get one, and you're like, should I do the hint? Should I get the hint to like fill that one word in and you do it? And then you're like, I didn't do it on my own. And you feel so much yeah. less satisfied with yourself. Yeah. And it's just, it's to me, it's like, I, I've found this cycle that made me very excited and happy and, and fun with fishing. And now I drop the live scope down and I find myself, Matt, after two hours of fishing, getting discouraged when I'm on the lake. Like if I don't catch a fish within two hours, I'm like, I suck. I'm looking at all these fish. Yeah. I know they're there. I just am terrible. And I just feel like like crap half the time when I'm on the lake. So when a pre-live scope, I'd grab for six hours, happy as I could be, because I'm like, I'm gonna find them eventually. I and I don't know it's like the, it's like that ignorance. You don't know what you don't know. And so it's yeah. like I, I could continue to grind and be like, hey, I maybe pulled up, maybe they weren't fish, they weren't active, but I could like kind of justify it. And this is all just my own personal problems. This has nothing to do with like yeah. the guys who are crushing with live scope, nothing against them, anything like that. And that's the problem I have is I make a living that teaching fishing. And that's the number one tool right now is live scope. And it's more of like, I don't really enjoy live scoping, but that is the number one thing right now. So it's like, I'm obligated yeah. to teach it almost. Cause that's just like what is trending right now. And I have the ability to teach it. I can catch fish. I've caught fish on live scope. You guys have seen my videos. I have lots of videos on live scope. It's not like I'm anti live scope by any means. I have tons of videos of me catching them on live scope, even back to three years ago when it was just starting to happen. So I'm not anti live scope by any means, but I have found that it has diminished something in fishing for me slightly. And that is a personal thing. That is not a, um, uh, and I think that that's what's affecting my fishing lately, Matt, is I getting in, I'm getting in my own head where like I'm trying to still use the old tech to keep my old, you know, uh, dinosaur brain kind of happy. But then I know I need to use a live scope because that's what I'm trying to teach. And I'm doing neither of them all the way and I'm not catching as many fish. And it's like I'm like, oh, I need to graph these fish with 2D sonar first and then catch them on live scope versus like. Why don't I just side image a big flat? I see a couple of fish and a couple of stumps and okay, I don't know exactly what's down there, but I'm gonna drop the scope and I'm gonna start fishing. And like to me that's like sacrilegious. Like to me that's like I that goes against everything I've ever done. But that's what I have to do almost to catch them and do the way it's is now. So I don't know. It's it's weird. Well it's and weird. there's there's also I mean, I, I relate to that so much from a tournament perspective, because it's like you you there are times you feel like if you're not doing it you're like well everyone else is catching them right now and i'm not catching them because i'm not using it and if i'm not catching them I, you know the assumption is that you should be using it mm -hmm. and it's what that's one of the biggest things with it you got to recognize when to use it when not to use it and that's not necessarily just based on like lake type or how the, the fish are setting up but really what fits in that that angler's you know the their own fishing style right like it 
if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And, you know, there are, there are a lot of anglers, even at the professional level that are kind of choosing not to use it, which is fine. The problem is if you get into one of those bodies of water where it really is the player, you better be using it or you're probably going to get your butt beat. Yep. Um, but it, it, it it's, I mean, that's kind of like the dilemma that I feel like everyone has. And, you know, from a YouTube standpoint, the thing with it is it's kind of goes along again with like all the live footage and tournaments. It's like, you can do a video on it. You can talk about it, show how to use it. But, you know, from your standpoint, are you going to do 15 videos in a row on it? Probably not because it, it, it kind of is the same, you know, you, you can show how you lure fish out of a brush pile. You can show how you lure the fish doing the same dang thing out of a boulder. You can, you know, there's, it, it kind of changes it. It changes, you know, I know we've talked about this too with respect to YouTube and just making videos and how you, how you can showcase it and not showcase it and how, but it changes the game, you know, like it, for me, when I do my on the water videos, I almost try to do it more like a story, right? Like, this is what I think is going to happen. This is how I'm approaching it. This is what I'm trying to do. You catch a fish. I succeeded in what I thought I was going to do. Maybe it's not the right thing to do, but it still worked for, for a fish or two. Now it's like, it, you almost feel like you get the cliff notes, right? Like, yep. well, if I show, if I show the, the forward facing sonar, it kind of doesn't, you don't need the story, like no, all yeah. that background, why I'm doing what I'm doing now. It's simply, well, there's a fish there. There's not a fish there. You know, I've, I've mentioned to you before, like taking my, my little boys fishing, my, my seven-year-old Hank has got, you know, to the point where he's actually like a really good little fisherman, but he gets mad at me at times. If I, if I'm not seeing a fish, what he's like, why are we fishing here? There's no fish on the screen. And as a, as a dad that like hurts me because I don't want him to look at it as the video game. I want him to look at it as I'm spending time in the outdoors. I'm enjoying, you know, my time with dad and he's looking at it like a video game and I, I don't fault him for it. Like he watches all the live, he watches everything, you know, it's a, from an efficiency standpoint, he's probably right in some circumstances. Now, in that instance, we were fishing the river we live on, and I'm like, Hank, you're not going to see most of the fish because they're so tight to the cover that, you know, the the live scope's not a huge player from that standpoint. But there are there's there is such an overwhelming, like, sense of tornness within the fishing world right now that people just don't, they, they, nobody... I would say you've got 10% that are diehard scopers, 10% that are like, this is terrible for the sport, and another 80% that are like, I'm just torn. I'm torn. And that's, you know, I think that's probably how both you and I are. I mean, you know, I, I can tell you at the professional tournament angler level that the majority of those anglers, I'd be willing to say 75%, if not higher, if they had the choice to get rid of it, they would get rid of it at a turn at a professional tournament level. And it's not, it's, it's not because they have like issues with it. It's because it's changed the tournament game so much. It's taken away a lot of the different uh, parts of tournament fishing that really could make an angler, you know, separate anglers. You know, there was so much of that intuition and so much of you know having your past experience that now has all been jumped over like you said so you know do, will it happen i have no idea will you know is it a good thing for the sport i don't know is it a bad thing for the sport i don't know about that either like i i don't know but it is a very it is a frustrating time as somebody that loves the sport of fishing because there is such separation right now in the sport like you know, I, I, I do a video and I, you know, I'll, I'm real inefficient and there's a glance that I've got forward facing sonar on and I'll have hate comments. You know, it, it's like I, I may not have even used it to catch that fish, but because I have it on, it's like I'm a terrible person. And it's like I, I don't 
feel like I should be a terrible person for having it on. But at the same time, there's part of me that does feel like I'm cheating at times because I've got it on. And it's like, I, I don't know. I really don't know where this is, where we are headed with this. The, the other thing that's crazy, Matt, is like, a lot of people get hate comments. I don't get hardly any hate comments about live scope, which is hilarious. Most of the comments are like, uh oh, don't show this to Randy, which people are just joking and messing around. That's fine. Yeah. And I think that's part of the reason why I've kept the style because I, I do go through and explain the sections of the lake I'm running into, why I'm going in the back of this creek, because the water clarity is X, Y, or Z. And like, because this is the seasonal movement of the bass. And then I live scope or I, I side image and down image and I find all my fish with that stuff. And so it's like showing the, I guess, skill of fishing, though that's not really a thing. It's just kind of what people perceive. But if I'm really, I, I guess I would still talk about the water clarity and stuff like that. But if I really had to go back and fish the back of this creek here, like Duck Creek on Grand, my real strategy now should be, okay, I can tell that there's this water visibility change back in this creek. There's, you know, springtime, water should be warming. Now let's get back in this creek and let's go down this channel swing bank and drop the scope and let's scope over here and then let's scope down this pocket and then let's scope a few boat docks. Let's scope this bridge and then let's scope some shallow laydowns in here. And that's the video. And I'm just scoping everything. And there's two issues with that from a content standpoint. This is completely um, – oh, by the way, I'll talk about this later. Anyways, um, they were saying that Sixth Sense stole my Versacraw idea. That may or may not have happened, but that wouldn't be the first time people stole one of my ideas, so it's fine. Um, the uh, Anyways, so getting back on this. So the idea with the live scope stuff is that um, you go through these areas and – if you don't have live scope, you can't replicate what I'm doing, okay? So that makes the content un, unapproachable for anglers who don't have live scope. But then if I go back here and don't use live scope, I'm fishing in a way that's not the best way to catch fish. So the guys who want to learn how to catch as many fish and the biggest fish as possible and have live scope, they're, I'm teaching them a suboptimal way to catch fish. So it's a literal lose-lose scenario for a content creator because it's like, I either go out and don't use live scope and I'm teaching something that is just objectively a worse way of fishing or I'm using it and I alienate 50% of my viewers. So it's like I'm, we're kind of screwed as content creators from that perspective too because it's not like I could go out and say, oh, let me just go fish a jig down this bank. This will feel really good. It might feel good for me, but it's really not the, what I should be teaching because it really is like, okay, I'm teaching you a bad way to fish. Congratulations. Like go out and finish – middle of the pack in your tournament, even if you have a great day flipping a 11, 16 pounds jig on the back of docks. Like that's the part that's really frustrating. Yeah, I, I get that too. Uh, you know, doing a lot of educational content as well. There's times where it's like, well, I'm talking about fishing a spinner bait. Well, a spinner bait, like, I mean, I think it's valuable to tell, talk about a spinner bait, but in a lot of situations now, a spinner bait is not necessarily the best bait to be throwing if you're in a situation where you should be using forward facing sonar. Like that's, that's such the, it's such an odd thing because you're like, I should probably, you should probably just be talking about forward facing sonar if you want to improve an angler faster more than anything else. Like I, I'll stand behind the idea that if you took two people that have never fished before, never fished, you put them on the front of a bass boat and you, you had one person where, you know, you just showed them the ropes. This is how to cast. This is how to do everything. And then you put one person, you put them on the front of the deck on the boat and you put a tarp over them and they had one hand, their hands could stick out where they could cast but they couldn't even see the lake. All they could see was the, the forward facing sonar unit. I think that person would catch fish faster than the other person who could actually see what they're doing. And, you know, without forward facing sonar. And that's just because it's easier to break it down as a game. It's easier yeah. to look at your screen to scan, be like, okay, that dot is a fish. I'm going to throw, I can see my bait going down versus like, trying to walk somebody through all the other ideas of fishing, right? So like much. here's a transition bank, here's a point, here's a, you know, contour lines and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, there's so much more to that when it's like, you can leapfrog it, look at the screen and, and, 
figure out where the fish is. You know, and in an ideal world, it's all valuable. Like the best anglers are the ones that truly understand what's going on in the lake and then can utilize their forward facing sonar to pick apart those areas. Like, I mean, it's all valuable. I, I'm not necessarily saying that somebody that never has fished before can all of a sudden be the best fisherman ever, but I, I'm simply stating that, I don't, you know, I don't know you can about really, that. I mean, I, I don't know about I, that though, Matt, cause like, it, okay. would take, it would take time, but take, I, you, you take can take a guy, let's take I a mean, local team trail, Matt, or a local, a local trail. And it's guys who've been fishing these lakes for 25 years. They've won multiple boats on the lake, all this stuff. And this is a story happening all across the U S Yeah, these are the best anglers in this lake. They know all the nuances of the weather, the, the stuff, all the stuff. And they're going out and they're using their old school techniques. Then you put a kid who has never fished before. Maybe their dad takes him out a little bit. They dad's maybe just like a middle of the pack guy. They give him a live scope and let them fish for two to three years. They are going to be able to compete, if not beat, that guy who has all that experience on that lake in a lot of situations. Maybe not all the time, but like if the fish are on lakes where there's drains, Demiki rigs, offshore stuff, brush piles, all that stuff. Someone who's really proficient at that, even if they don't have a good, as good of an understanding, if they have basic understanding of structure, of contours, like maybe say two to three years of experience, they can compete side by side with a lot of these guys. Maybe not everywhere in the country, maybe not every lake, but it feels like that's happening where... I know when I fished after two or three years with the knowledge I had, I would never have been able to compete with all the local hammers mm -hmm. in the lakes around me. But there's kids like, I remember when Cody Huff came up. He was winning every single Table Rock tournament when he was 17, 18 years old. And he'd been fishing for three, four, five years. And he's beating guys who have been hammers on Table Rock for their entire lives. And that's like that, and it's because of the forward facing sonar. He caught his fish with live scope. That's why he was beating everyone. Yeah. But, but here, so I, I'll counter that by saying, is it his fault? No. That that not. team that had all that experience is, is not using it. Like, I, I'm saying that I still, that that team that has all that experience would be as good if they spent the time to learn how to use forward facing sonar because now they've got the understanding of the lake before it as well. You know, which, which is an interesting thing because you hear right now there's a lot of talk about how, well, everything we used to know is all BS, right? You can throw everything, the, the book of bass fishing, you can throw it out the window. I have a hard time with that because that book was written without being able to pick a random fish here and there. That book was written to improve the success of an angler without forward facing sonar. So the book is correct. It's just not correct with forward facing sonar. And what I mean by that is the book didn't tell us to go chase those suspended fish because the guy who was fishing the bank channel swing banks would kick the butt of the guy random casting and standing timber all day long. So the book was right in telling you to fish high percentage spots and fish all this stuff. The problem is there's a new chapter to the book. And the new chapter is forward facing sonar. And now we have the ability to go fish stuff that was never uh, truly accessible. We could fish it, but your percentage of coming in contact on a random cast was not, it wasn't, it couldn't, at that time, that couldn't compete with doing what the book did say. So in my opinion, it's not the book's not wrong. The book is, it's like the first half of the book now was written without forward facing sonar and the back half of the book is going to be written with respect to forward facing sonar which you know is going to be a completely different book at that point but it, it's well, yeah, not it's... it's not that we just throw everything out the window because there's still there's still a ton of value to that the other part of it that's interesting though is like someone could skim the first 20 chapters of that book and then read the last chapter with the forward facing sonar targeting the individual fish and probably do just as well, if not better, than someone who's thoroughly studied the first 10 chapters or 20 chapters of that book and knew, knows it cover to cover, but didn't read the targeting individual you don't fish, even, even need if they to have live the first. Even, even if they have live scope, Matt, because guys who have live scope who read the beginning of the book but don't know how to target individual fish and go chase them down. They also, they're just going and finding the same brush piles they've always fished. And all Live Scope is doing is making them a little bit more efficient. They can see the fish around there. Mm -hmm. It's that targeting the individual fish and knowing how to get those fish to bite, the theories, all that stuff. 
that wipes away a lot of it. And there are guys who do say, like, hey, I'm just going to go into random spots on lakes, roll into an area that just doesn't got, hasn't got a lot of fishing pressure, and I'm just going to go find a bunch of fish and just roll through that area and catch them. And it's not because it ever looks good on a textbook or whatever. It's just because the least number of people are fishing there, and I can just go scope around. And is that a valid strategy? Is that a great strategy? That's awesome. Like, it's great that people are doing that. I'm not saying, like, there's nothing against people doing that. I'm just saying that, like, that is a, co- it's, it's not that, like, you're saying that the stuff textbooks are wrong. It's just those fish were never really catchable in an efficient manner pre live scope. So it's yeah. not like what we're learning is that those are bad. The other areas are bad areas. It's just there's these, we've unlocked this brand new potential. Because we were never able to put a jig right in front of a fish's nose that's swimming randomly in the middle of the lake. Yeah, and I I would say what you just said about fishing less pressured areas is actually even a a strategy of a lot of anglers at this point. I mean, I've I've talked to a lot of people. You I read all the articles and everything about tournament wins, and it's a pretty common thing now to hear somebody say, "Well, I saw a lot of boats over there." So I went over there where there weren't a lot of boats because they're that much. They, again, the idea being that you're, you're not necessarily looking for that school of fish. You're not necessarily looking for that brush pile. You're looking for in a five fish derby, you're looking for potentially five bites. Cause a lot of times your quality is even, I'm not going to say all the time, but your quality can be pretty good when you're doing that. And it's, it's a whole different approach to tournament fishing i mean it really is like in the 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 crazy part about it is you know i think people are probably like well how like how much water could you cover if you go out there and you're scoping around well again if you're talking about technology and the skill level of the anglers i mean guys at toledo bend it was if you didn't know what was going on it would have looked weird because everyone had their trolling motor on like 80 to 100 percent and they're just you're going like this. I mean, on almost full bore because you're, you're turning the trolling motor, scanning, turn the motor, scanning. And, you know, if you've got more than one unit, you can shoot multiple units. And now like Garmin's got their saltwater version, which shoots like seven miles ahead. And, you know, it's, there's the efficiency is getting better and better to the point where you can go fish for a lone rogue fish. That's the only fish in an entire cove, but you can cover a cove pretty quick now to the point where if you get one bite an hour and you can, you know, you fish one cove an hour, you'll get one bite an hour and you have a decent bag at the end of the day. And that, and that never like going back to the book of bass fishing, that was never in there. Like go look for the crummiest looking area and find that one fish that decides to live in that crummy area. That was, that was not a, a means. And Maybe part of that is based on the pressure of these fisheries now that those fish, you know, there's more fish that have been spread out. But I, I tend to think that a lot of fish live in areas that have always looked bad to us. The problem for an angler is it's really hard to efficiently fish those areas because there isn't an isolated piece of cover. There's not a good contour line. There's not a, a lay down. There's not anything for an angler to say, I want to fish that. And, and I will actually, I will counter that because that is something I've always loved to do is find that random lay down tree on a mile long flat. That's five feet deep. It's the only piece of cover and there will always be a fish there. The difference is I would find that one piece of cover that that fish related to versus now guys are just, you just scan the flat, (laughs) You, you know, you're not necessarily looking for the cover. You're looking for that one random fish that's swimming around. For sure. Well, so there's a couple of things here. I have, I have a question for you, Matt, and I have, then I have a. I want to broach a topic with you that's kind of we've talked about a lot and maybe get reactions from people. But I have a great question for you. This is from Chris uh, uh, Serafin. He says, Serafin. He says, "What about people who know both uh, the live scope and traditional stuff? How big of a gap between people who know it all versus just scopers?" So guys, like I would say in this category are a Jacob Wheeler, for example. He's just the epitome of that, where he was really, really freaking good pre-live scope. And he's really good post-live scope. 
what's the gap between a Jacob Wheeler now and let's say, and I'm just going to throw out a couple of names of guys, not necessarily just because, like, I'm not saying they're bad fishermen, but let's say like a Drew Gill, who we hear him on podcasts, that's his thing. He four facing sonars. He's only 21 years old, so he doesn't have as much accumulated knowledge. So it's hard for him to say he knows it all about every fishery. He just like it just from a from a time on the water skill standpoint. From that standpoint, he probably doesn't know all of the old stuff like Jacob does. Not taking anything away from Drew, but like, what would you say gap is? Because we saw them at Toledo Bend. Drew is neck and neck with Jacob. So like, what is that gap there right now? I mean. I mean, if we're talking angler skill level, Jacob is by far one of, you know, the best ever. Drew, in my opinion, will be one of the best ever. Like, uh, he is, he is, I, I, I just enjoy talking to him. He talks, he talks with the experience level of somebody that's done it for 80 years. And his skill level is phenomenal. Now, you know, so from that standpoint, I expect him to continue to excel at the fishing level. I don't know Drew well enough to know if they took forward facing sonar away where he would be. I mean, he's got all the mechanics and everything, but I think I think he I think that gap would widen between him and Jacob. Like, I think it would hurt Drew a heck of a lot more than it would hurt uh, Jacob. But yeah. I mean, I, it, it's one of those, it's one of those things. I mean, we've seen, and I guess Matt, real professional quick, just to, to dial that question in real quick is not just not to say like, if we took it away, cause that's kind of obvious. It's more of like, do you think that the gap between, because Jacob has all that extra fishing knowledge, do you think that that makes him so much better than like the best scoper? Cause I'm thinking Drew Gill is like one of the best scopers yeah. on tour. So is like, is Jacob like, still like light years ahead or is it like because drew knows the scope so well he's he, he's within a puncher's chance yeah, of taking yeah, down yeah, i got you yeah i i think i think really what's happened is that gap is narrowed i think i think it's probably hurt jacob more to have the scope be there you know i i mean he's still he's dominant with both he's one of the best scopers out there but i, yeah. I think if you're looking at top level anglers it's probably done a much better job at narrowing the gap and making everybody uh more even across the board now that that doesn't necessarily mean everyone's even in the same skill set like i think you had guys that were shallow water monsters you know an andy morgan a greg hackney jason christie that were way at the top just based on shallow water skill set and their skill set hasn't changed much. I mean, they they may use forward-facing sonar. I don't really know. I assume they all use it to a point. But the gap of them being above everybody has dramatically decreased. And, you know, I think this the learning curve is so fast now that it's it's really made the field a lot more even across the board. And it's it's taken away... In a way, I feel like it's taken away the like superstars of the sport because there were so many guys that were, I don't want to say light years ahead of everybody, but it always seemed like there were like 10 or 15 guys for years upon years upon years. And now I kind of feel like it's all, like almost any given tournament could be won by anybody. Like you still have some guys that are definitely consistently at the top, but yeah. I, I think it's, I think it's changed the, uh, the the all-star you know roster if you want to want to put it that way and you know i think you can see that by saying you know a lot of the guys that excelled beforehand that are not huge forward facing sonar guys are still pretty well you know they'd still do pretty well in tournaments but all of a sudden there's a bunch of guys that didn't really do well that now excel and it's like well what changed between the first five years and the last three years and it's they've gone all in on forward facing sonar and to, taken, to, I yeah. mean, really to their credit, like they went from being an average angler to now being at the top of the game because they recognize the value of it. So they're, you know, in my eyes, they're the smart ones. Like yep. the guys that have said, I'm not going to do it or we're late to the game uh, are probably, you know, behind the eight ball because of it. So, and, I mean, uh, I don't fault them for trying to get better. 
It's the guys who adapted to the flipping techniques that figured out the square bill crankbait back in the day. The guys that really tuned in on the paper graphs, the 2D sonar, the side yeah. imaging, the 360 imaging. There's always been a thing that people have adapted that has made them dominant because of that. And the people who have always been able to adapt the fastest and the best always stay on top, like a Jacob Wheeler. So none of what I'm trying to say, and I know none you're trying to say, is taking away from anglers who are doing well with forward-facing sonar because it takes time, hours and hours of time. Anyone who has live scope knows it's not easy to do what these guys are doing. So it's not to say that they are not putting in the hours and figuring it all out because that is they're they're using stuff that's within the rules of the tournament and they're making it happen so that's a separate kind of like i'm i don't even want to touch that because that's like i have respect for all anglers who do it at the top level so that's kind of the deal there it's more for me at least on my side this is kind of back to a question or a comment over here is like it's more of a moral thing matt to your point than like an objective thing it's like do we do we feel good about it? Do we? It's like touchy feely, which is the worst because I'm not a touchy feely type person when it comes to like my fishing. I'm very analytical, like very. This is the way to do it. This is the numbers. Here's the math. And now I'm like, ooh, four facing star doesn't make me feel that great sometimes when I'm on the lake. And like I hate that that's how it how I'm becoming with fishing because I'm normally not that type of person, but it's how I'm feeling. So it's kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's I, I'm telling you, like, this is such a conundrum in the sport because you're not alone. Like yeah. the majority of people out there and it, and honestly, it's kind of even more concerning, like the 10 percent on both sides that are so solid on one side. It's like, don't you recognize, though, that like there is a lot of issues going on here? Like this is really mentally toying with a lot of people. And I realize they may feel so strong in their opinion, but it's like, you know, for like for me, it, you know, I, I feel like I'm caught right in the middle and part of it's because of my age, right? Yeah. Like right around the 40 year old, I've done this for 20, you know, well, 30 years fishing old school, if you want to say it that way. But I also feel like I've got a long potential history in the sport and I want to do whatever I can to improve. And right now that's working on, all the different electronics to continue to get better and it's like i i i see both right like i'm like i love old school new school is kind of fun too but i feel like i'm kind of cheating i feel like i'm kicking everything else i've learned out of the way and it's like but if i'm a tournament angler i gotta do whatever i can to get better like if i was a played baseball it's not like i'm gonna skip batting cage just to you know because i don't agree with it like because i have a moral issue and it's it's just such a weird place to be like it really is an odd place and i don't see this changing for a while like i i think technology i mean i'm hearing rumors about new stuff coming that's gonna make the current stuff obsolete and it's like i mean it like and again it's it's one of those things for me i i have to separate it like from a fun fishing standpoint to me that's a whole different discussion at, at a professional tournament level standpoint that's a whole different discussion like yeah i feel like th there's much better reasoning at a tournament level to say we need to limit whatever it is not even just electronics but you have a set of rules that you play the game by if it's fun fishing to me like you know i was i mentioned when you were gone that wisconsin is talking about potentially creating a law that would ban it and it's yeah. like i don't i don't know how i feel about the government mandating what i can do to go out and catch fish and i realize there's conservation issues there but to me that's like that's kind of a whole different discussion versus like if an organization says hey we want to be no electronics if you want to play that's fine we'll let you in but like there's that's different to me and um well, if we're going to go down also, this rabbit hole, Matt, I'll go down the rabbit hole with you on the banning thing. Let's take the A-Rig. I've talked about this before, but like the whole A-Rig thing. The reason the A-Rig got banned by pro anglers is because there was a lot of guys who exclusively threw the A-Rig and started dominating in pro fishing. And they were average to below average anglers. They committed 100% to throwing the A-Rig and they became above average to elite anglers. They were taking a bunch of guys' money. And for lack of a better term, people got annoyed at it, and they're like, we need to get it banned because it took some of the skill out of fishing. The reason that 
and there were some other re- issues with it with like multiple baits and hooking fish in the side and there were things yeah, that was I, a lot I, of it. I I would argue that and say it was much more political. There was a lot of under the table money that said we're not selling baits and we're going to pay the organizations money to ban it so that people would go back to throwing okay. traditional baits. So like say, I, I, and okay. I don't know okay. I don't know exactly what happened but well, I think there was there more politics behind it and I think most people would also argue right now that that was too quick to happen with respect to banning the yes. Alabama rig. I agree. I agree with that too. Yeah. But so the I, same you know, logic I, could be applied to the live scope stuff with like the potential, some of the skill, some of the baits not being thrown. Like there's, there's this idea with the baits, but if I watched Bass Live the other day, Matt, every single commercial during Bass Live was a Hummingbird, Lawrence, or Garmin. Most of the time, all three commercials a beatdown mounts graph commercial, uh, two different mm-hmm. battery company commercials, and then some other type of electronics focused thing. And that was all the commercials. It was all electronics, forward facing sonar stuff. So who's bankrolling these tournaments? All the electronics well, I, companies. <laughs> yeah, I I heard. I don't know if this is true. I heard there was a. I think it was eight hundred thousand is what the organizations get from the electronic companies. Well, you know, as big as as big as. Everyone thinks that Bassmaster and MLF are these big companies. Eight hundred thousand dollars is a huge sum of money for them, and you know whether whether that money would be pulled or not, I don't know. Like I have yeah. no idea. But the reality is, it is a business. There's going to be decisions made that are based on uh, money, and you know, I and I think to me that's that's a reason why I don't think you're going to see it get banned from tournaments but i i i i do think at some point from a tournament standpoint there needs to be limitations on the equipment because you know just like you were talking about with golf well pga golfers can't use souped up drivers like there's limitations because guys hit the ball too far guys get too good is really what it is they make a a hard golf course look easy Yep. And that's really what live live scope and, and active target and forward facing sonar is doing is it's, is it, and again, I don't want to make it sound like it's too easy because it's not that easy, not but that easy, no. if you look at the weights, the weights have gone up quite a bit the last couple of years. I mean, they just, you know, we just finished up at, at Lake Fork and they had, I mean, yeah, they had, <laughs> somebody, somebody made the case that oh, well, there were only 10 century belts at Lake Fork this year in the Bassmaster Tournament. And the last time they were there, there were 12 century belts. Well, the reason there were 12 last time is because they took the top 12 and they only took the top 10 on the final day this year. So it's not like, that's not a a valid argument. If anything, if you're going to do, you look at the average weight of those century belts that they gave out, and it was like 25, 26 pounds a day versus this last time it was 30 pounds a day, like 120 pound weights. I mean, the, the, the tool is extremely, it's a, it's a fantastic tool. So I do, I do think at some point you're going to see within professional, the top level tournament circuits, there will be some form of limitations. I'm not saying they're going to ban it. I'm not saying they're going to do it in the next five years. At some point though, the technology is going to be so good they will have to do it and i don't i don't know when the right time is or what those limitations are or should be but i do think you'll see it because just like in other sports the equipment gets too good i yeah. mean you know you aluminum bats in baseball i think it would be fun to see it personally because guys would be hitting dingers every every other guy up but you know they don't do it well, so this brings me to the last thing I wanted to ask you about, Matt. We've talked about this a lot. But there's there's the whole concept with YouTube and content and all this stuff. And we talked about it a little bit earlier, but like there's two thoughts about this. It's like teach the newest stuff because there's new things to be taught, there's new things to be learned. And it's like teach the newest techniques with live scope, the newest baits and trends, all those things. And I feel like I have the platform and the ability to do that. And that's something that I feel like is needed, and and there's people who really would appreciate that. There's this other argument, though, of 
maybe just not using live scope at all relating to the average fisherman and showing where to find fish on the lake because that's what i've always done is show where to find them how to determine certain creeks determine the water clarity take all these other elements and if i can catch them in these areas without live scope imagine how well you could catch them in these areas with live scope so that's kind of another argument to be had and i know we're not going to come to a conclusion on the stream but i want to put that out there one to you and also to the audience of what you guys think in the comments of like you know there's there's a lot of complexity to that and i feel like there's still not a lot of guys who are teaching the live scope stuff they're using it but they're not teaching it and i think that that's something i have the ability to do of like calling out the fish explaining what's actually happening on the screen which i think could be very valuable and i've done that already but then there's also this part of me that's like i don't need live scope to go out and grand and figure out how to catch fish i'm not going to catch them as well as if i had the live scope but i feel like if i just committed to just know stuff i could figure it out and catch fish without the live scope so it's like where do you draw the line do you say a dinosaur do you not like it's it's really hard to uh in my for me it's it's hard it's maybe not hard for anyone else but it, it's definitely a something i've been struggling with and i kind of have already come to a conclusion on it which maybe i'll spoil here at the end but um what are your thoughts at least and what are you guys thinking in the comments I mean, I, with respect to YouTube, I'm, I'm going to stand by the thought process of do what makes you happy. Yeah. Like as soon as I try to make videos for, you know, other people, you know, they, they give me, they'll oh, try this, do that. And it's like, well, I didn't enjoy that. Like, and then that takes away the fun of YouTube for me. So like with respect to my channel, I'll talk about it at times. I, I'm not going to, it's not a, it's never been an emphasis on my channel. Like I'm, I've, my stuff is short, you know, tip videos. A lot of times it's more bait centered. I'm a, you know, I'm a tackle junkie at heart. So I, I like maybe focusing more on the baits. And from that standpoint, I mean, I'll, I definitely use my electronics. I talk about them in the videos when necessary. And, you know, I, I'm not changing anything. Like I've had a lot of people leave comments saying that my YouTube channel is going to go down the drain because of forward facing sonar and this and that. And I'm like, I, I, I don't personally see that. I'm not going to change anything. I'm going to keep doing it the way I do it. And uh, if that entails some forward facing sonar footage, I'll do it. If it, if I'm not using it, I'm not going to talk about it. Like it, I, that's how I look at it. And uh yeah what are you what are you gonna do okay so here's one thing is there is a comment here from 0017 bulldog a long time viewer long time subscriber and he said we don't watch fish the moment to see you watch a computer screen to figure it out we watch to learn understand and try to improve unfortunately bulldog all i did was stare at the screen all i've ever done is stare at the screen for my entire time i've made my youtube videos i i might not it might not look like it in my youtube videos but I grab for six, seven hours a day out of my eight hour fishing day. I was always just staring at the screen. So like it's disingenuous of me to even say like, you know, staring at the screen is inherently bad because I took advantage of side imaging, down imaging, 2D sonar to catch all of my fish. I just, there's a new technology that maybe is something that maybe I'm not like a hundred. It takes some of the excitement away from it to an extent, but what I've decided Matt is I need to shift my mindset and let go of the past. And I need to embrace the future. Because I'm still young. I'm not even 30 yet. I'm 29, but I'm not 30 yet. Uh, and there's so much to learn about bass behavior, baits, small things, the timing of it. Like yesterday we were on Beaver. I was out live scoping the whole day. And from 11 o'clock until 5 o'clock, we caught four fish in that time. Then from 5 to 6.30, we caught like two dozen, like two and a half to three pounders. And there was just this flip switch that got flipped where they started chewing and it was the low light and we found a bank that was shaded by a hill. And like, there's all these things and that's the stuff I want to learn more about. And I'm not necessarily going to always focus my videos on like, just go live scope, go do this. It's going to be like these low light conditions and the, the wind was blowing in here for three hours as you got to the bait fish riled up and the water clarity and like i'm still going to talk about all those things and the the factors everyone kind of overlooks with live scope that is like the secret sauce of what the pros are doing i just need to change my mindset to say 
my secret sauce is that sort of stuff. It's not how do you side imaging anymore. That's passed me by kind of, I need to move on to new frontiers. So that's my conclusion. Whether people like it or not, that's just, that's what I, I think I'm going to be doing. What do you think, Matt? Whatever, what I do, whatever makes you happy, Johnny. You might want to, you might, you know, I mean, you might want to use some core tackle baits while you're doing it, but whatever, whatever else makes you happy, go for it. <laughs> Chris says, Johnny isn't a fisherman. He's an idler who occasionally casts. Yeah, I'm basically a pleasure boater That's who carries true. a fishing rod with me every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I will tell you, if, if you go fishing with Johnny, you better bring some snacks because you're going <laughs> to... You're going to be sitting there idling around for four hours before he even lets you make a cast. Oh, no, don't worry. You don't even know. I, I can't. I can't do that. I can't do that. <laughs> like, I got to I gotta make a cast once in a while. You're like, you'll be tooling around. You'll be like, well, there's four fish, but I think I can find more. And you'll be like, well, I would have I would have caught one or two and then gone. But you just you you have that mindset. There's always better. Like there's always more fish to be found. I don't like to let any fish go by without being caught. Well, I that's like what that's all. what I'm doing now. That's my dilemma is I'm trying to catch all these fish now. I'm I'm like that's good enough for me to scope, and I that's I'm losing it. But the nice thing now though is that you don't have to bring sandwiches anymore. Now you just need to bring a neck brace, and we're good to go. Cause yeah. you just be staring down at the screen yeah. all day. You better have a good chiropractor, dude. That's oh for gosh. sure. That's why I go. That's have, why I go to the gym, Matt. Be- you know. It's to work my neck muscles to stare yeah. at the screen all day. <laughs> do you have do you have like the beat down stand or a razor stand? I'm about to. Do you like, have that? I'm about to get it because it's as much. I'm not. I didn't have it before because I wasn't live scoping that much. Like I probably spent because back then, up until now, I would still graph for f- at least fifty percent of my fishing days up until well yesterday my last trip like even those days grand i graphed for at least 50 percent of my day so i wasn't standing up at the front deck staring at my screen very long so my neck didn't have a chance to get you know messed up i was still graphing a lot but like now i'm going to be staring at the screen a lot more uh, up front and like i don't like the idea of having it be so far away so yeah i'm thinking about getting a beat down mount i'm thinking about getting i mean i don't know i i still don't want the the crappie breaks dude but like i know that crappie breaks would be very useful um and catch more fish if you had them so i don't i don't know my 18 foot triton yeah. though is i i've i have left poles off of it for it's a 2005 triton and it hasn't had poles on it this whole time so i feel like i have to hold true no power poles no power breaks i'm just gonna go one one yeah, graph yeah, on you, the front one graph in the back roll i forgot about that you'd have to get power poles yeah because <laughs> you don't have power poles yeah that's even a bigger it's a bigger investment how long how long do you think before uh power pole comes out with their own brakes or or you see uh like lorance or hummingbird come out with their own you know i mean like hummingbirds got they're got the raptors and they got mincota so they could do it real easy lorance has the trolling motor they just have to come out with a braking system yeah People are saying Johnny no in the comments about the live scope. So I mean, guys, I'm I'm an electronics. That's all right. Guy. I got I got all you guys. Yeah. Come on over. You can still watch my channel. Well, that's what that's. The I nice mean, thing. I, there will be some forward facing at times, but yeah, I'm I'm. That, that's we'll why we got a great baits. team here. We got Matt. We got Miles, who's on a little bit of a break right now, but he catches them up shallow. We got all these guys that are great anglers that catch fish all over. So there's a lot of great content. That's the thing is that. You can't make content for everyone, and I know that like people would be like, Johnny, we want you to make content on this and that and everything. And at the end of the day, we just don't have time in our day to make content for everyone. So like Matt said, make the content you're enjoying. And for me, I feel like I, I enjoy teaching more so than I even enjoy the process of catching fish nowadays. And so I feel like for me that there are more teaching opportunities with the new tech than there are with old technique because if you want to go watch me fish without four facing sonar i have 250 videos and if you've watched 250 videos of me you've probably learned most of the stuff i already know at this point and maybe just go rewatch those because there's a lot of video content of me catching them without forward facing sonar but we're in 2024 your subscriber count is going like i know it's dropping (laughs) and then oh randy just joined the chat this is not good did he really no i'm just kidding (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> hey, you you uh you mentioned Miles. I talked to him earlier today. He got out fishing. He caught 26 pounds, best five, 26 pounds on the Ozark rig. Ozark rig with a B. with a Z Man. What is it? Z Man Zenko? What are they called? The Z Man uh their five inch stick, whatever that's called. Okay, so guys, we we have core tackle plug time. We have the Ozark rig and I haven't even made a video about it other than the one live stream with you, Matt, in October. You made one video about it, or a few. This thing is, like, selling, like, hotcakes. And we're not even talking about it hardly at all because it's selling so well. And it's because guys are absolutely straight smashing them on this thing. So They're not sold out at Tackle Warehouse, huh? They're not yet. We think well, we're, we're, we're sold out. We're on sold out. We don't have still, any more in our warehouse. So still have <laughs> if you guys yeah. want to buy some Ozark Greg, go buy them now because we are literally out and we're getting more in, but like we're out. Um, and it's just, you te- basically just Texas figure bait on here, but it gives it a very natural, unique fall. And you can go to our website, uh, core tackle.com. If you want to see photos or go to Instagram, we have reels and stuff on Instagram, core tackle, Instagram showing how to use the Ozark rig, but it's pretty crazy matt how many good fish are getting caught on this thing and like we're it's to the point where it's selling itself because so many guys are catching them on it yeah i love that thing oh man oh we got we got some cool stuff matt in the works too for core tackle we got some new baits coming out for the classic we got our lot we have have potential on some sneaky baits coming out we don't know if it's going to come through or not but we got some sneaky stuff potentially coming down the road that uh could be pretty cool so much so much stuff. There's like, like there. I'll tell you this story. When when we were on Beaver, we had like 13 pounds of fish, and the sneaky bait that was being talked about that we potentially could maybe maybe not. I don't know if it's gonna happen. Don't give don't give out the, what the bait is. I won't give out what the bait is, but okay. there was a guy fishing down the bank who's the creator of the bait, and he caught 15 pounds of fish from the bank while we were out there live scoping on this bait because this bait is so freaking good we were throwing at those fish with, with all kinds of baits live scoping them they wouldn't bite it he's out here on the bank bringing in four pound large mouth three pound small mouth from the bank on this bait this bait is juice so yeah we're gonna we we're trying to get get that going so um you may be seeing we're talking we're talking with him. we're talking with yeah. them to see what's going on but that bait is absolutely oof, it's insane so Oh, yeah, got some got, good stuff coming. We got a lot of fun stuff in the works. It's just a matter of uh, getting it all out there, I guess. Keeping and keeping what we have right now in stock, which is the hard part. For sure, they're saying James is saying there will be no need to watch your YouTube videos eventually. Thank you, appreciate that, James. Thank you for the optimism. That's uh, really really <laughs> keeping me going this afternoon. And then. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and but then the uh, they're coming, they said johnny's folding and it's like well you know live live uh die a hero or live long enough to become a villain in randy blockett's world that's just the uh it's the the tale of the story what if what if we found out randy caught him scoping today oh no that would be unbelievable that would be the that would be the biggest yeah like gotcha in youtube history i i won the toyota series using live scope on kentucky (laughs) it's randy holding up the truck yeah i i would be willing to bet you that did not happen that would be uh... amazing um wow (sighs) let's see here um Eric says this is the best real breakdown of what's happening. Thanks, appreciate. Yeah, we're trying to, uh, we're trying our best, guys, to keep it real and, um, yeah, we're 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 doing our best over here. We 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 can't appease everybody, make everybody happy, and we're not trying to, you know, bash anybody for what they want to do. Like we're kind of Matt and I are both kind of on the fence about, as you can hear, like. We went through. I went through the five or six stages of grief during this live podcast live stream. So, you know that I'm not like this over here diehard scope or anything. But it's like, it's just you got to make a decision at some point. <laughs> if you sit on the fence forever, you're gonna get you know a rash on your butt. So you got to move off the fence eventually. Dude, I see you. I see you laying like awake at night, just like 
in the fetal position, just like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I've actually had sleepless yeah. nights over it. Like seriously, because I get back from catching nothing on Grand and I'm like, I know if I just scoped all day, I would have caught him. I know if I had turned the live scope off, I would have caught him. But having both is screwing with my brain so much that like it's like I have this like error, like an Excel function error in my brain. So I have to like remove one of the variables to get the function to work. That's how I feel. Well, I I mean, I don't think it's that big of a decision for you to be losing your mental saneness over. But uh, we'll, we, we'll love you regardless, Johnny. For sure. Well, I mean, we still love Randy, so that's how that's all good. Randy, Randy's get doing his his non live scope thing. I guess I'm going to be doing my live scope thing. We're still the polar opposites as usual. So. I mean, yeah. So I mean, that's really what's happening is I'm just becoming more of a neutral country here because now you're going to be a hardcore right, he's hardcore left, and I'm going to be stuck in the middle having to listen to you both complain and whine and. That's what's, you know, I'm okay. I like being neutral. I Hey, I've told you before, in the words of the great Fergie, drama, drama, we don't need no drama. <laughs> She's wise. She is wise. Well, I mean, hopefully I don't get too much drama, but I haven't got that much drama. Um, uh, I don't get that much drama as it is, so I'm not super worried about it. I, I... I don't really, not that concerned, but main thing guys is also like, we want to be catching fish on core tackle products like Matt's saying, and showing you guys how to use tools like deep dive app. And you know, those are the things we have. And I want to just teach you guys how to use like an avionics map to still find fish and things like that. There's so many tools. There's so much stuff out there that, you know, there, this Grand Lake's a big lake. It's not like you can just drop the scope here and catch them every single day everywhere. It feels like that if you, watch these Bassmaster shows and stuff like that, but guys are still spending multiple days practicing. They're out there for three, four days figuring out which areas are better for the scope and not. Like there there is nuance to it. It's not just literally drop your trolling motor in the middle of the lake out here and just go catch five pounders. That just isn't exactly what's happening. So all right, quick question. Grand Lake classic site we two two weeks, a little less than two uh two weeks from today. What will be the winning weight? What will be the winning pattern? For the classic. Yeah, three day tournament. Is it going to be a smash fest? Oh no, no! <laughs> it's going to be rough. Like there's going to be there's going to be haves and have nots. There's going to be guys who catch twenty. It's going to it's going to there's going to be a big bags caught. Um, if I had to guess. There's two two predominant patterns. I think it's going to take. Pull up the deep dive. Tell me what the. I think it's going to take over fifty pounds a day to win for sure. So that's like a day. Sorry. What are you talking? About? Sorry, over fifty pounds total. Sorry, not a day. Over fifty pounds over three days. Sorry, over fifty. You don't think it'll be over sixty? Twenty a day. I think that could be. It's doable. Like. If if you had to say like over or under sixty, I would probably say under most likely, but I could see it being over. I just yeah. think for three days that's hard on Grand, um, but I I wouldn't put it past them. I mean, I could be completely shocked because like we saw what Evers did up the Elk River where he got on these shallow deals and he had twenty eight pounds. So I could see someone catching twenty eight pounds a day if they figure out the right thing. But I think probably the two patterns that are going to be great are going to be guys scoping out in front of boat docks catching fish either around the sides or around boat docks, there's still going to be some pre-spawn fish. But it's been really warm recently, so I could also see some guys that are catching them, honestly, like a way that I think someone could really catch them, and it was when Alton Jones caught them. He was fishing in, like, these little areas, and I don't know if this is how someone's going to win it. Dredge, but this is dredge cuts. These little dredge cuts. Little dredge channels. And yeah. they're li you can't really see them, but he was dragging a jig through these areas, and he was just guessing. And he finished, like, fifth place in a classic, or third place in one of the classics, and he was fishing these dredge channels, dragging these fish that are just pulling up to spawn. And if you could scope those fish, and you know you're in front of one, and just hold that bait in front of them, those are big females he was catching. And I think that could be, like, a sneaky little deal. Like, that's something I would try for a full day of practice, is, like just drag those deals and like 
it may not work, but and then it's probably going to get one down here by the dam, and someone's going to be in one of these cuts, and they're just going to be, you know, fujiing around with a Demiki rig and catching six pounders, and that's probably what's going to happen. But you know, there's hope that cool patterns could also prevail. Like I still think that's a cool pattern if someone got on like that little like deal up here. What uh, like local tournaments is it's taking big weights or no to win? Like our guys, uh, is that no is idea, the Demiki thing? Is the Demiki thing a popular technique on Grand Lake? I don't know. I mean, I freaking hammered them in May, catching them on a tush with a spunk shad and caught yeah. big weight on. So I know it's doable. I don't know how many guys. I'm not in the connected in the scene over there on Grand, to be honest. I know that it's like a lot of guys are trying the Demiki thing and they're not catching them, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, yeah, I, I did find I, I'm willing to bet you the other day. I don't. I would not be surprised if the winning weight is way bigger than sixty pounds, and it's you know guys getting onto a Demiki thing because that's one. That's one thing I've kind of. I feel like I've kind of seen uh, last year and this year, like as much as you you think everyone's doing it, it's really not. And then you get like a the high level tournament rolls in, and all of a sudden it's like, holy cow, where did these fish come from? I mean, that's what. That's what happened at Toledo Bend when yeah. we were down there. The BPT was down there. And, I mean, it was the average fish you were catching was four to six pounds. And I know Toledo Bend's got a lot of good fish in it. But for me, it was eye-opening because I needed to pick up some baits. And I went to three tackle shops around Toledo Bend. And not one of them had anything that was remotely good for Demigi rigging. Like, which to me says it's not a popular tactic around the lake. It doesn't mean guys aren't doing it, but it's also not like everybody's out there doing it. And I don't, I could see Grand Lake being in that same category where, you know, you get some of the best in the world to show up and do it and they're fishing for seven bites a day and they're averaging a four plus pounder. For sure. Yeah. Kevin, I don't know what question you're talking about. There's a lot of comments coming in, so I'm not ignoring your comment. I just missed it. Uh, anyway, so yeah, no, I think that, uh, I think there's a lot of, I mean, this probably was going to happen. I mean, I was in one of these cuts the other day graphing and uh, like right in here and there was bait in 70 feet of water still. This was like last week. So I didn't really, I wasn't sold. On, I was trying to catch them not on the Demiki. That was like my actual goal because I didn't want a Demiki rig them. So I didn't try it at all when I was there. But I know that there's a lot of bait and there's a lot of stuff. Michael Neal caught him in the back of Ketchum, Demiki rigging in this area during the, the, yeah bpt red crest a couple years ago so like it happens and this is where i caught them on the demiki in may when i smashed them so it's it's gonna happen there's a lot of drum and catfish out here actually i actually the only time i've ever the one day i had demiki out here i spent the whole day demikiing it was after a shad kill water temps were 35 degrees so that was not the best day to probably be out there doing it but um the there was a ton of catfish and drum and stuff so the thing is, is Grand's big enough where there's some cut somewhere where the fish are just going to be loaded up. I remember for Red Crest one year, or that where Red Crest tournament, Thrift was in here and he was catching him just throwing a jerk bait around and he was catching him and there were there's a bunch of fish in some of these cuts. But they can be here one day and move out. So that's the one thing is like on those sort yeah. of fish, you have to relocate them. And so if you can have multiple areas going and... Maybe there's not enough areas to sustain all the guys who wanted to meet you rig. So, I don't know. That's kind of where I feel like it could still happen. It's probably still going to happen. But there's a chance that something else plays. I just don't know what that would be. Um, but I can't bet against the Demiki rig. Because I bet against it at Santee Cooper, and it's still got one in Demiki rig. I bet against it on, you know, Fork. And that's, I mean, they didn't really Demiki him. They were jerk baiting him. But that's still what they did. Toledo Bend, they caught him doing it. So, yeah, yeah I mean... Jerk baits are pretty good on Grand, so jerk bait bite could still be good, but I don't know. I don't, I don't really know. Kevin, you never put your question back in here. He said, "Ask him if I'm avoiding in him," and then he never answered. And asked again. Um, <laughs> okay, well, anyways, we're gonna roll out of here, man. It's almost nine o'clock, so uh, I'm gonna get back to it. So, anyways, um, Tin Horse Monty, how's it going? Uh, had me on this podcast a little while ago, and you as well. So, um, yep. yeah good deal so uh does matt think the new youngsters that made the elites now would be there if not for forward-facing sonar that was what kevin asked 
I mean, I, it's, it's a I don't, question. I don't know the kids. <laughs> I don't know the kids well enough, but I mean, if you look at previous history, you haven't had such an influx of young kids coming into the opens. Uh, you know, I think they are, I, I, I really feel like it's, it's like, if, if you're growing up right now and you're a high school angler, that's what your focus is. And these yeah. kids that graduate that, made it to into the the uh elite series this year that's all they've ever really known so they are experts at it whether they would qualify or not i can't i can't answer that i mean my assumption is that not all of them would but you know several of them are like the all they do is fish i mean they're they go from one lake to the next to the next to the next i mean they may not have been in the elite series but they were fishing more than anybody else so my assumption is they are excellent fishermen like i don't think anybody makes the elite series or bpt just because they got lucky i mean that doesn't happen whether their skill set would have gotten them there if they if, if there was no forward facing sonar i don't know i mean probably not all of them some of them for sure i'm sure probably would have still made it and you know the the reality is everything was well within the rules, you know? So it's not like that nothing should be taken away from any professional angler, whether they use it or not use it because they're doing what they should be doing. They're trying to excel their professional tournament game and that's what they've done. And, you know, the reality of it more than anything, like I think for a lot of pros like myself, when you see how good these kids are, it's somewhat scary because it's really slapped a lot of anglers in the face and been like, Oh man, like I, you know, I could be weeded out of this game. Like I've done this for well enough. I'm good. You know, I've, if I'm talking about myself, I feel, you know, good about my skills, but these kids that are coming in are so good. I mean, you see it happening in the elite series right now where I think, I think if you look at all, all nine guys that qualified through the opens, they're all top 40 right now, I think. And like five, half of them are top 10 in points. So you're really talking about an influx of talent that excels and masters forward facing sonar to their advantage. And the reality is if, if you're not trying to improve your game, whether that's forward facing sonar or doing whatever, the talent that's coming in is good enough to push guys out that have, that have made a career that have, you know, done well enough to continue to requalify. But those are eventually at some point, every, you know, if you look at the elites well, or the BPT every year, you've got, you're going to have five or 10 guys coming in that are probably as good as the guys that qualified this year. And in five years, that means half the field is going to be those youngsters which means half the field that's there right now is not going to be there. And, you know, whether, whether, you know, that's a knock on forward facing sonar to say how good it is or how good the talent is. I can't, I'm not going to make that comment. The anglers, the anglers are obviously great at doing everything right now. That's well within the rules. And from that standpoint, I, I think that's great. I'm out there trying to get better every day with forward facing sonar because I don't want to get kicked out and you know, I, I like to improve and I will do that until I'm told that it's no longer a legal tool. And at that point, okay, take it away. Like I'm, I'm indifferent either way. Like I, I really don't care if they get rid of it or not. I, I will keep doing what I need to be doing with every tool that I can do while it's legal. And, um, You know, I, I, it's, it's very interesting just to see, you know, how well they hang. Cause if you, if you do look at like, and I know we're only two tournaments in, if we're talking about the elite series, but when you've got nine of the top 40 guys, you know, it, so it looks like, you know, if they keep that up, they're going to requalify. You're looking at, I think the top two AOI guys are rookies, Milliken and, uh, uh who am i whoever i don't know who's in first right now i don't i don't know either i can't think anyways the the point is like if you look at previous years i want to say it's like 
after a couple of years, I bet you 80% of those opens anglers that qualified are getting bounced out. So like the, the anglers that actually make it for multiple years in the elite series is, has been pretty low, but I think moving forward, you're going to see it be really high. Like it probably is going to be this year. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess this is what I'll say is that for facing sonar, those who are good with it are unlocking fish and locking techniques that other anglers are not using. And they're using that to their advantage to do very well in tournaments. So is it, a there was someone who said is it for facing sonar call it what it is it's a layup compared to taking actual skill it still takes skill there's still things in it is it a flatter learning curve i believe so i believe they took more time on the water to learn side imaging down imaging things like that in the old school methods versus what you need to do with forward facing sonar if you and because forward facing sonar plays almost all the time in every situation you can learn that one skill and you can apply it a lot of ways versus maybe some of the older school methods, but it doesn't take away from what the angles are doing. In my opinion, it's just, it is what it is. So, I mean, I mean, like you said, we're going to see how it all shakes out. I'm not losing sleep over it. My decision to do what I want, what I'm going to do with my channel. Um, you know, I, I, I made this, I've already lost enough sleep over it already. And I think it's sometimes you just got to make, a decision and move forward and just kind of keep trucking and that's what i'm gonna do and that's where i i mean i've always been an electronics guy guys if you watch my channel you always know i've focused my channel on electronics all my best videos are electronics videos so it kind of feels weird to me to not embrace the new technology when i've grown my channel on the electronics and that's all i've been known for so if you're bashing me now and saying you used to be able to catch fish without forward facing so it takes more skill well, what's from you stopping you from saying you only could catch fish because of side imaging and down imaging? But I don't think anyone's saying that because they watch my videos and they know I can still catch fish without it. But it's just you could make that argument. So that, I, it's hard for me to then make that argument for other people who are using forward-facing sonar and say they couldn't catch them without it. Though it feels different, but I can't make that argument because it's just I would be I feel like I'd be a hypocrite in that case. That's how I feel too. I mean, if there's anyone out there that should be going all in on forward-facing sonar, it's probably you who have <laughs> built a massive following based on electronics. Like, that makes that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and I'm not going to stop teaching where I'm finding fish, the contour map stuff, the, the environmental stuff, the wind, all of those things that still play into all of fishing, fishing behavior. So if you guys want to watch my channel, I'm not just going to – <clears throat> drop this live scope scope around cut the video and end it i've never made videos like that i always talk about all the other elements that are happening so you're still going to get stuff out of it there's people on here who are saying i didn't stare at my graph and that's how I, i'm going to edit my videos the same way i always have and somehow people still didn't realize i was graphing for six of the eight hours i'm staring at the screen just as much now as i would be if i'm forward facing sonaring so my videos are going to reflect the same thing i'm going to show all the other stuff and the forward facing sonar is going to be a part of the bigger video with the instruction and everything still so that's just for those who are super concerned like i'm not just gonna do three hours of unedited live scope content every single video that's that's not the plan so <laughs> anyways um <clears throat> but uh yeah good deal guys uh i don't want to get left behind i already feel like i'm antiquated matt i feel like my i feel like i was a really good fisherman and now watching all the stuff, I feel like I suck. And I know it's not true, but I'm like, man, I was really good. Now I'm like, I'm so far behind the forward facing sonar curve. I feel like I'm like, I didn't commit all into it. So I already feel behind, which is crazy. It's scary. Cause it's like, it hasn't, it hasn't like I have, it, it hasn't been like, I haven't been using it, but I already feel like I'm behind and that's very concerning too. So I'm going to buckle down. I'm going to learn it and I'm going to teach you guys some juice about forward facing sonar and I'm going to give you all the juice of what these guys are doing in tournaments, show you all the stuff like I always have and continue to piss pros off in 2024. It's my goal by sharing all the juice. <laughs> I don't piss any pros off actually. No one really gets mad at me. Fortunately, maybe. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't know anybody video. that's really pissed. <laughs> <laughs> Stop giving my juice, Johnny. Oh man. Now people are calling out me out in my hairline great i'm gonna go back to my hat guys i'm getting older not not everyone has the matt stefan hairline over here damn 
<laughs> what do you mean the hairline? People are saying I got my a hat on. Changing. Look at I had I had a uh, precancerous thing burned off my forehead again yesterday. Go get your skin checkups, people. We're sunscreen. That's why I have a hat on today. Otherwise, I'd show I'd be showing off. You know why our I, the reason fishermen don't have hair is because we blow down the lake at seventy miles an hour and we lose hair every time we do that. That's very true. Um, computer guys, like when someone said uh, uh, Johnny can make the elite series, and computer guys, he blanked two times at grand. Me blanking two times at grand, actually, Matt, that excludes me now from ever being a good fisherman the rest of my life. Apparently, so that sucks. I, I'm, I literally I'm, disqualified I'm from ever qualifying for hey. a pro level. Hey, I zeroed at Sandy Cooper day one, turned it around, still got a check on day two. So just because you zeroed twice doesn't mean you can't catch them the next time out. 100%. Don't get discouraged. Not everyone has three days of practice and all the time in the world to go out there and fish. Sometimes you got stuff going on, so don't feel bad if you don't catch fish. I don't catch fish. Matt doesn't catch fish after three days of practice. If we're struggling, there's no reason why anyone else should be concerned about struggling because, like, we we fish quite a bit so like don't get discouraged don't get down like it's just it happens you go through slumps you go through bad days you go through bad scenario like situations you're in a bad mental state there's all kinds of stuff that happens with fishing it's a very like weird game that should be your next video should be the last two times i zeroed this time i smashed them there we go that's a good video <laughs> hi i i, I <laughs> I sucked it. Well, I, I, I was terrible. I solved the code. The code was to stare at my. I, I increased my screen time on four facing sonar, and my fish catches increased dramatically. There's my video. That'll make people happy. <laughs> Good deal. Uh, appreciate it, guys. Well, Matt, we'll, we're gonna if we keep talking, we're gonna get ourselves in trouble with all this stuff. People, we're getting in trouble. Yeah. Oh man. Um. Yeah, I know. I know you're teasing me, computer guy. I, I, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very open to jokes. I'm just laughing over here. I don't, I don't take anything in the comments personally because I've learned a long time ago that is not a recipe for success. So, uh, I, I, I appreciate people busting my chops like Matt. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty chill about it all. It's not a big deal. <laughs> Good deal. Just, Matt, get, Matt and I give it. each other so much crap, you have no idea off camera. <laughs> well, that is not actually true. Johnny, you beat me up. You give me 10 times more crap <laughs> than I give you. That's pretty I, true. I wasn't even giving you crap when I said you zeroed twice. That's just a fact. Oh, man, you just like, fact. you like to tear into me on everything. Oh, dude, it's Make great. Make fun of everything. It's great. Feel like it's the bully at school again. <laughs> Johnny comes over and just verbally abusive sometimes nobody's nobody's gonna believe it and i'm just like sitting here he's sometimes i cry after i get off the phone a little bit a little bit especially after that that day where i was catching five to one on the swim jig and you're still sticking to that frog man that was i was that was, I think, was the worst day i've ever busted your chops that was bad that was yeah bad. that was bad that you was gave hard. it to me good that day that's all right that's all right i'll get you back we we do need to do some uh one-on-one -on -one challenges i uh we, we got to come up come up with something good to bet and then uh we'll do it somehow we got to do a challenge we'll meet in the middle we'll go fish some iowa lake some okay mud hole yeah let's do it meet you, halfway uh bi yeah. fishing uh we don't have codes on our website or anything right now we can barely keep inventory in stock so we've been trying we we would love to do discount tones down the road but we don't have any invent we have, we have hardly any inventory left to sell so we're working on getting more in so uh maybe discount codes coming down the road but uh hopefully not because we're selling enough I love, I love i love how you're laughing about it <laughs> i'm i'm the one that deals with the production facility and i i don't feel like it's that funny but well i had to turn the marketing so, gas off man i mean i was like i had to rev down the engine we had to drop down a couple of gears <laughs> that is true that is true I'm sitting uh, here twiddling my thumbs. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, All right. We got to get out of here. I got it. It's past my bedtime. Me too. Oh, man. We had so many people on this stream. There's still 280 people watching us just 
blow smoke right now. This is hilarious. Babbling. We're just talking yeah. about nothing. Well, I, ap- I apologize to all of you. I apologize. <laughs> People are like, oh, it's, it's, it's just late and we're delirious. We just do- That was a great therapy session, though. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, audience. You guys were busting we, me up in the comments. Are we still live or not? We are. We're still live. Are we live? Okay. We're, we're still live. Um, <laughs> well, you, you got rid of the map. I've been looking at the map trying to figure out where, where Grand Lake's going to be one. Oh, <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> just go where I'm not fishing. I can give you my GPS logs, and we'll just go. Hey, we, and if anyone if anyone wants to see us, we will be at the classic. That's very true. We have a booth there. We have a booth. Johnny will be signing autographs. Johnny will be signing autographs. It, it, make sure you wear your whitey tighties. <laughs> that that the marker shows up better on those. That's very true. It really is. All of your female fans will you can sign all of their stuff, man. Well, hey, yeah, you know how it is. I, it's hard. You get off the weigh-in stage, it's hard to even get back to your boat because of the groupies that are lined up. So many groupies. <laughs> you Fishing, stop, man. People are not going to realize we're joking. They don't get jokes on you yeah. on YouTube. Every, <laughs> everyone, everyone thinks about rock star lifestyles. The professional fishing lifestyle is, it's wild, wild good stuff anyways well everyone have a good night uh this was great uh i'm gonna try to get back uh my boats in the shop but i'm gonna try to do some on the water live live streams again where i live stream for my boat with live scope so maybe you'll like that maybe when you won't, it, what, we're gonna try to get back to you got a fixed date yet on that if any no. did you t- have you told them how your your tire almost came off the trailer yeah twice so my trailer axle since my trailer is like 25 years old or whatever it is uh 20 years old my axle was having issues and the uh, tire almost came <laughs> off going on the highway the, like four months ago. And I noticed it pulled over, thankfully. And then I got the axle fixed, apparently. And then a couple days ago, driving down the road and the tire starts wobbling again. It almost comes off again. I have to get my boat towed again by a tow truck. And so I think I'm going to try to get a new, like a brand new custom axle made because it's like a weird wonky axle. I'm going to see if they can do that. I don't really want to get a new trailer because it's expensive. Um, and I have to get the boat towed then to a dealership where they can t- lift the boat off and put it on the new trailer. And it's a whole thing. Uh, I just need a new boat. But I really like my 05 Triton. If there's any boat people listening, like dealers or anything, who you know want to hook hook Johnny up with uh, a boat, you know, I... <laughs> I don't know exactly what that would look like, but uh, I, I kind of like my old Triton, so I really want to make it last. And the boat's fine; it just has a, it has only like three spots of gel coat that are still intact. But other than that, the boat's running great. Don't you have a newer motor on it? Didn't no. you repower it a few years ago? No, no, <laughs> no. It just has a yeah. lot of hours on it. A lot of hours. Well, hey, at this point. It doesn't, hours don't matter that much because you're not going to be idling like you used to. That's very true. I seen a new trolling motor. Yeah. This is great. I'm going to, I'm going to put like, my engine's going to stop. It's going to be like, I, it was running on the fact that I ran it so much. And it's going to be like, what, ha- what happened? Why are you only running me for 20 minutes a day? I like, I like how you described an axle that broke as it has, pro- it had a few problems. You need a new trailer for sure. Yeah, I think I might just need to get a new one. We're gonna look into it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see what's going on. But uh, worst case scenario, it's gonna be three or four weeks. So uh, I'll make some other content in the meantime. We have the classic. We have a bunch of stuff going on, so it'll be fine. Anyways, okay, guys. Well, talk to you later. Uh, we'll see you guys next week for another live stream. It won't be maybe as exciting as this. Maybe it will be. Maybe I'll do another hot button topic. Uh, Randy's reaction to Johnny's statement on live scope that would be a great live stream that would get just as many views it would be i would watch that you should join in and moderate i don't know you you're getting me in trouble <laughs> this this we're gonna surprise attack matt come you want to jump on live stream tonight yeah sure what are we talking about ah we'll just figure it out on the show and then i get you on the live stream where there's 400 people yapping about <laughs> their opinions on live stream. yeah yeah, we gotta I, go. I don't know what we're. <laughs> See you guys just, later. Just Talk. end it. Would you get me out of here? <laughs>